Welcome to An Evening with the Candidates, presented by the Venango County Republican Committee and the Young Republicans of Venango County. Live from Rhodes Auditorium at the beautiful campus of Venango College, here's Good evening and welcome to an evening with the candidates at Venango Campus, Venango College in the Rhodes Auditorium. And uh, what we would like to tell you tonight is, is that uh, we will be hearing from uh, candidates for the uh, district attorney's race and for uh, the Venango County Corner. You know, it's said in Pennsylvania that there are four seasons of the year, uh, autumn, winter, still winter, and highway construction. Well, as April 1st, uh, we have entered into highway construction. I would add a fifth season, and that would be primary election season, and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, we have the opportunity to hear from some of the candidates, and uh, as one author uh, might have written some time back, the gentleman who told us that everything he needed to know he learned in kindergarten, um, Mr. Robert Fulgham said, when you get a chance to vote on something, by all means vote. And uh, I think tonight, uh, when you have the chance to hear from the candidates, uh, we should by all means listen. Uh, wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, I'm sorry, and I should have introduced uh, Mike more formally. Uh, see, I always forget something when we're going live. This is uh, Mike Thomas. Mike is the uh, publisher from the Venango uh, Weekender. And uh, now I guess I can ask you a question uh, about uh, listening to the candidates. Well, thanks. Good evening to you, Mark. Good evening to you <laughs> viewers at home. Welcome to tonight's coverage of the um, Republican Venango County Candidates Forum tonight. That is correct. It's going to be an exciting event tonight. It's going to be uh, very interesting to watch, we think. Tonight marks the first occasion that the three district attorney candidates are all in the same venue at the same time talking about the same material. So uh, we've been talking to a lot of folks as they've been coming into the auditorium here. And I think one of the things they're looking to do this evening is to find out exactly who these folks are and what their backgrounds might be and what they could bring to the job. So it'll be an interesting contrast to see all three of them sitting there at the same time and uh, should definitely provide a very interesting evening. And I also understand we won't make it just yet, but there will be a big announcement happening early on in tonight's forum tonight. So we invite you to stay tuned there at home and uh, follow us tonight as we're here at the event. Excellent. We'll be getting to that a little bit later. You know, if, um, if you were in the audience tonight and you came to visit uh, this particular event, um, what is it that you might expect to hear from uh, the candidates? Well, if I was a, a Republican voter in this primary, I would look to see, first off, uh, what are the, the qualifications? I think your first uh, objective would be to meet each of the candidates, listen to them with a fair uh, mindset, and look and see what are their backgrounds. And I think that their backgrounds and their experience will speak a lot to uh, what their abilities might be and what their approach is. I was having an interesting conversation with a local attorney here that's not one of the candidates, and I was asking him, what is he looking for in one of these district attorney candidates? He said, well, it's actually, it's in the non-legal things for him that would make the difference. Uh, the legal aspect, if you think about it, is locked up, that the job is very uh, rigid. It's a matter of following the law. And there's some discretion there about whether or not you press charges in your office, but he made the point that, that uh, the education piece, how folks integrate with uh, local law enforcement, how they work with the school system, those non-legal elements and focuses will be the difference maker for him. So uh, if I'm sitting there in the audience, which we will be later, what I'm looking to see is uh, kind of those, those non-essential elements and what each candidate brings to the table. I would think that perhaps one of the things that folks would be looking for, actually there's two or three things that I think folks might look for, and that is how, what a DA candidate brings to the table in terms of say community involvement, how will they engage the community or will they engage the community? What kind of vision is there? Uh, what kind of uh, political or legal philosophy do you bring to the table? Uh, I think that influences quite a bit uh, how the, the job will be carried out. And I think as we progress tonight, you will probably get to see that there's uh, three candidates and three different flavors of um, how, the, how the office would be run. Absolutely. I think one of the things that will be interesting tonight for folks is that up to this event and as the candidates made their announcements and went through gathering their petitions, 
Uh, a lot of talk has been had behind the scenes. There's been a lot of uh, media coverage and a lot of press, but it's always focused on one subject or individual subjects. And tonight is the first opportunity for folks to see them all sit here on the stage together, side by side, see how they play off each other and interact with each other. This will be a real chance to, to really gauge how do these candidates handle the pressure, uh, how are they similar? I think a lot of the things we're going to hear tonight will be similarities across the candidates, but to be expected in a uh, one-party primary. So I think tonight will be interesting to finally see them side by side and not just talking through the press and talking through their campaigns. Yeah, uh, and I've seen some of that already. Uh, I've had a chance to see uh, Mr. Hadley on the campaign. I've had a chance to uh, see Mr. White on the campaign. And uh, they're very short, quick messages, uh, generally very positive. Uh, about why you know they're more qualified to do the job, uh, sort of a short one two minute commercial, uh, and this probably won't be that kind of a of a oral exercise tonight. As you say, this will be something that uh, will require them to uh, do a little bit of thinking on on the spot and uh, to require uh, to uh, respond to questions that uh, may or may not be expected. Um, do you think that they're ready here for some surprise questions? I think that they probably are. Uh, I think all three of the candidates know, based on the little bit that we've been talking to them, that uh, the job has very dire consequences. It's a very serious position, and uh, they have a lot of influence in the community. I think one of the surprising things that, that our viewers at home might find tonight is the relationship between the DA's position and how it can impact the community and Venango County. We were talking earlier about Venango County's facing some serious economic challenges and I think each of these three candidates based on what we've already heard and seen from them make a pretty compelling case respectively how even though their position is a legal position within the court system can have a potential impact on the economy and so the connection between some of the bigger challenges look for that tonight if you're watching at home uh, a couple of these candidates are drawing very stern lines on things like crime and, and uh, out of city uh, involvement with some some gang activity and some violence so I would definitely keep an eye on that and see how that might relate to the overall health of the county you know that was a, uh, an issue that uh, Governor Tom Corbett brought up on the campaign trail when he was running for governor of course he was uh, the state's attorney general for quite some time uh, and actually made a few appearances here in Venango County as certain cases broke. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I was able to talk with him uh, as he was running for office uh, was the need for a law and order kind of a candidate. And he pointed out that uh, without law and order, uh, you don't have a society, you don't have uh, the necessary uh, things in society to ensure a good economy or a good anything else for that matter so that uh, you know, a tough line on law and order is extremely important. Absolutely, absolutely. Mark, why don't you tell our viewers at home a little bit about each of the candidates that we're going to see here tonight? Well, uh, we have four candidates here uh, in the uh, in the uh, the room in the auditorium tonight that we'll be talking about. Um, the uh, we are actually supposed to have five, and uh, to pull a line from somebody else, a funny thing did happen on the way to the forum tonight. Yes, indeed. Uh, we, uh, we found out earlier uh, this afternoon around 1 o'clock that uh, Adam Guthrie, who is one of the, uh, was one of the candidates for uh, Venango County Corner, uh, actually uh, withdrew from the, uh, the contest, uh, citing a variety of personal reasons. Uh, he is a, a businessman, of course. He is uh, part owner of the Huff Funeral Chapel and uh, Cremation Services in Franklin. And they have one other location in Harrisville and possibly a, a third. And uh, it's, uh, it is something that he's uh, concerned about, not having the, uh, the time uh, to put into the job uh, to do it properly. So uh, he's also looking for time with his family as well. So uh, Adam Guthrie will be out of the, out of the race. So uh, for all intents and purposes, Christina Rue, who is the uh, incumbent uh, Venango County assistant, uh, corner at this point is running unopposed and will, I would imagine for all intents and purposes, be unopposed in November. Uh, don't really see any opposition forming in, in that department. Uh, Christina is uh, quite an educated person and you probably know a little bit more about her than I do. I do. I know uh, Christina and her husband Chad on a personal level. Uh, uh, my stepson is in Boy Scouts and Christina has uh, 
four boys, if I'm not mistaken. I lose track sometimes because the Roof <laughs> family is kind of all over the place because they're so involved. But uh, Christina and Chad over last year uh, served as a, they were talked into serving as a den family. And Chad, the husband, starting next year, took a post as the, the Cub Master. So they already are a busy and active family. They <laughs> put a lot of time into it. And I will tell you, as a den mother, Christina Rue was unmatched. Her, her crafts were excellent. Her activities were excellent. Uh, she definitely, I can see even through that experience that when she focuses on a task and has a goal, she meets it, she exceeds it. I think she will do very, very well. So nice family with definite, uh, definite solid credentials. You know, she was educated uh, here in the area. Uh, she got her degree in, um, uh, oh, I'm going to stumble over this. It was... Um, Forensic anthropology. Yes. Uh, from uh, I believe it was Mercyhurst, and had the opportunity to uh, learn under some very learned people and to take part in forensic investigations throughout northwestern Pennsylvania uh, as well as Ohio. One of the things that really impresses me about Christina is back in 2001 she was able to uh, be in the recovery operation for uh, the uh, flight 90. I think it was 93. 93. Yes. Yeah. So uh, she has a lot of experience, uh, has a lot of interest in this, and uh, I think, as you mentioned, will probably be a very good candidate uh, for the job of uh, Venango County Coroner. Absolutely. So. She's uh, one thing Venango County has working in their favor. Christina is no more than 35. She's definitely not very old, very energetic, uh, would bring a lot of talent to the table. but. You know, in the interim, she, in the past, she was going for the office and has taken, uh, she's the assistant the Niagara County Coroner. She's continued her education and gone to various seminars. She's been in New York City. She's worked with uh, the director of the coroner's office over there. So Christina has kept herself very fresh, very active, and uh, as, as I hear, her clinical skills are excellent. So I think that uh, Venango County has a very good choice, and Adam Guthrie was also an excellent candidate. Uh, we were talking to the Roof family here when they came in, and they were surprised to hear the announcement today. There had been no rumblings uh, up until that point, but uh, we're told that uh, the chairman of the Republican Party, Martha Breen, will be reading a concession statement tonight, mm -hmm. or I should say maybe a withdrawal statement withdrawal tonight. Withdrawal statement, right for Adam Guthrie and uh, while he's not officially endorsed or, or said anything along those lines we were told he will be supportive of Christina's candidacy so it's nice to see that they get along and, and I think Benango County has a very nice option here in Christina Rue. Excellent and uh, probably the main event tonight is of course the question and answer period uh, that we'll have with the three candidates three Republican candidates for the office of district attorney uh, we have uh, Sean White, Mike Hadley, and Brenda Servideo uh, that will all be here tonight uh, answering questions and talking with us hopefully later on. Um, Sean White is a private practice attorney who has uh, spent some time as a Venango County District Attorney back in the 80s uh, when he first got out of law school, and I think that was at, uh, Duquesne uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, very experienced on both sides of the table. Uh, he spent some time with the, uh, with the DA's office, then went into private practice and has been a, a criminal attorney uh, since then and is now, I believe, in his 20, 27th year. Uh, that sounds about right. It's yeah. been, been quite a while. Yeah, he's, he's been around quite a while and very versed uh, in criminal law. So uh, we'll be hearing from him tonight, uh, among other things. Do you have anything that uh, you might add on, on Sean? One of the things I think that we expect to hear tonight with Sean White, he's been so far in the campaign very hard hitting on his experience. Uh, Mr. White tonight will talk about uh, the cases that he's been involved in. He's had quite a few verdicts on both sides. He's been uh, prosecuting and a defense attorney, but uh, he feels that one of his strengths based on the campaign material that I've seen and his appearances is experience and tenacity. So I think that you'll see Mr. White tonight will focus a lot on that skill. Now, uh, we have a couple of other candidates as well. Mike Hadley is uh, also a private practice attorney. Uh, Mike is uh, an, an Oil City uh, resident, uh, I believe actually an Oil City native. Yes. Uh, he did his uh, schooling uh, a little further out west in Michigan and in uh, Ohio and uh, brings a desire, it appears, to want to give back to the community. Um, one of the things that uh, Mike has in his training is the he, also spent some time as a prosecutor uh, in Toledo and in a county in Michigan. And so he has some experience uh, with prosecutorial skills. Uh, but he is also qualified, like um, Sean White, to uh, uh, practice law before the Supreme Court and many of the other superior courts of the U.S. and Pennsylvania. Um, I think Mike is going to be probably the one that will stand out tonight as being probably the most affable. He has a, a 
uh, a very bright personality and while he is as tenacious as the rest of them uh, he is a very affable person uh, and I think you might agree. Absolutely. He's uh, definitely very laid back and a very excellent public speaker. You know, one of the things that, that Attorney Hadley has been hitting on through the campaign thus far is that uh, he's been involved in some pretty high profile cases and he talks about the position of district attorney often is accompanied by a lot of media attention. And uh, he's definitely right to say that it takes a bit of skill and finesse to deal with the media's attention and to get through some of those challenges. Mm -hmm. So I think you'll hear tonight that Attorney Hadley will talk about he's had experience. Uh, some of the cases that come to mind as I think about it, he was involved in all the litigation around Two Mile Run about a decade ago. Uh, he has, has tried several cases in front of the state Supreme Court, and I know the U.S. Supreme Court, he was part of a case. So uh, he's no stranger to, to large venues, to high publicity cases, and uh, I've heard him make the case thus far on the campaign trail that navigating the challenges of being a public attorney is different than being a private practicing attorney. So I would look for him to talk about that this evening as well. He has impressed me as being very well versed uh, in the law as well. Uh, when I've had conversations with him, uh, he's pretty good at uh, citing uh, examples of what he's talking about almost at the drop of a hat, you know, very good at uh, illustrating his points. So uh, we have a lot to look forward to uh, from hearing from Mike tonight, too. Absolutely. Uh, Brenda Servideo is um, the only uh, lady on the panel tonight, the only one of the three that uh, is... Um, female running for the uh, office of Venango County uh, District uh, Attorney. Uh, she has a reputation of being quite a bulldog in the courtroom. Um, and she will tell you that uh, right up front, that she has done nothing for the last 11 years except be a prosecutor. She has no desire uh, to be a defense uh, attorney. Uh, she has some experience in the Army JAG Corps. And uh, as far as Second Amendment rights, this is a, a lady that can pick up and handle um, an automatic weapon. So <laughs> She's a formidable opponent, in other words. Yeah, hey, um, absolutely. Uh, very good. Uh, I've actually seen her in action uh, a couple of times in court cases. Uh, very impressed. Uh, you know, has a very good set of credentials. Um, what would you say? Well... I don't know her personally, but one of the things that was really telling was earlier uh, in the evening, you were telling me some statistics about some of her results in Venango County, and I think you were spouting off uh, she has recovered $500,000 yeah, in compensation for victims. Yeah, a little over half a million dollars in restitution. And it was uh, $100,000 in forfeited bail back to the county. So the impression that I get, and also seeing uh, she has a, a very nice website, she focuses on fiscal responsibility. And we all know that, that one of the... Um, skills needed in the district attorney's office is to run an office with a large complicated budget. So I think tonight you'll see attorney Servideo talking a lot about personnel management and how to handle a budget with her office. Uh, I think that, that she'll talk a lot about being very um, conservative in her spending. Her website actually says that she's not going to spend barely any money on the campaign. She believes that it's her time and money is better spent pursuing other interests. So. I think you would definitely have that kind of a flavor and a manager in the office. So I'm looking forward tonight to see how they compare and contrast in that department. That's another important part about the district attorney's position. Now we've talked uh, the last few minutes about all three uh, district attorney candidates and we've talked about what the folks in the audience might expect to hear. Um, I wonder how it would be if we turned the tables. What if I asked you if you were one of the ones running for office? what would you expect to have to deal with tonight? Well, I would think that a lot of the questions or a lot of what my goal should be tonight would be to, to give a complete picture of myself. The number one enemy when you run for office is, is the public's perception of you. And as long as it's accurate and it, 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 it properly reflects who you are, what your goals are, what your vision is, I think you'll do very well, especially if you believe in your platform and what you think is happening. But uh, there's been so much talk ahead of time and there's always confounding factors involved that I'd say one of the priorities is to clean up anything that might be a loose end, address anything that might be an issue, and uh, clarify the record. It would be in everybody's interest. So I would think, based on some of the chatter we've heard here in the campaign and we've seen in the media coverage, there are a couple loose ends that need tied up tonight. And I think the candidates are expecting that, and I think that uh, they're very well prepared. What's happening behind us here, we can talk a little bit about the event as we're five minutes away from it, but you know, uh, you're seeing behind us here a meeting 
of the candidates' representatives talking about the questions that have been submitted. And I'll let you talk at a greater length about the process here, but this event is supposed to be very thorough, and it's, uh, it's quite scripted, but it's designed to address all the issues that are on the table. So these people here behind us are working very hard to try to get a fair mix of exposure and questions for the candidates. So. Yeah, actually, that's... Um that, that's quite a formula that we've run across tonight. The, um, the program that we picked up uh, for the event uh, is a four-page program, and about two and a half pages of those are rules, regulations, and guidelines about how this is going to happen. And uh, I won't go into a great deal of detail with that. Uh, I think I'd probably lose all of our viewers in the first couple of seconds. Uh, but you're right, it is extremely scripted. It is meant to be as fair as possible. Uh, to eliminate the possibility of personal attacks, because that's not what we're here for. Uh, Absolutely. We're here for uh, the voters to uh, ask uh, questions about things that uh, certainly concern them. Uh, the DA is the chief law enforcement officer for the county, so people have, rightly have a, a concern uh, about how things are going to, uh, going to happen with that. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to give some credit to the Venango County Republican Party and the Venango County Young Republicans. Uh, there are various parts in the country where this type of event doesn't happen, and there's been a lot of attention to detail and effort to go into this evening, not only to make it fair and impartial, but to provide a nice forum for folks here to meet the candidates and to hear the issues. Uh, if you leave it up to simply uh, the media's reporting us included in that, and you leave it up to simply just uh, word of mouth across the community, sometimes you don't get an accurate picture. And it's also nice, too, as our viewers can probably see or at least hear, the room is starting to fill up right now and there's a nice turnout so I really want to commend uh, the Venango County Republican Party and then there are some young folks working with the Venango County young Republicans that are part of this event it's exciting to see and it's, it's nice to have this this arena for folks to it to is discuss. Uh, there was a meet and greet out in the lobby um, for the first um, 60 90 minutes of this afternoon's event mm -hmm. it was nice to see people talking with one another uh, sharing ideas about issues and what have you mm -hmm. um, and to talk about something else that you mentioned was the influx of younger people into the ranks of the Republican Party. Uh, on the national scale, at least, there's uh, a lot to deal with uh, in that department. Uh, there's uh, a lot of social issues that have the potential to divide the party very deeply. Certainly. And uh, certainly uh, bringing younger people in uh, will help to fuel the conversation and help the party define itself. I think that will probably happen here, too. Taking a quick glance around the room, trying to count folks that look about 40 or younger, Granted, I tread on some thin ice here. <laughs> it looks to be probably about two dozen folks here that are probably under uh, well, I'm 40. 40. I have 16 years experience. Well, so. you, were, you were part of that, so you were part <laughs> of the 24. So <laughs> you got to count very carefully, but it's, it's nice to see a nice turnout. It is. It's very good. It's very heartening that uh, this is so important to so many people. And the reason f that it's so important is this is an off-year election. Um, in the off years, and we mean off of presidential years and things like that, odd-numbered uh, years, uh, when there are no federal candidates uh, running, when there are no uh, state candidates on the ballot. This is strictly local, and this is the chance for the counties and the municipalities to kind of turn on an eye inside uh, for a little while. The sad part of this is, is that um, in an off-year election, especially in a primary, uh, the voting turnout usually doesn't rise over 20 to 25 percent. And in some of the districts in Venango County during the uh, presidential election, uh, we saw some statistics that showed some of the, the precincts were at 70, 75 percent. So um, it speaks to how people feel um, this ranks in importance to things like that. Absolutely. Uh, so I think there's a few points everybody in Venango County can agree on. Number one is I think everybody is concerned with the county, albeit good or bad, but they're concerned about the condition of their communities and their county. But I think that, that folks should realize, and I think this room here tonight proves that, that these races, district attorney, the county coroner, she, uh, Christina will make points tonight about why she's relevant to the county. All these local government positions directly affect your home and the people that live there. So uh, it may not be as sensational as voting in the presidential election. You may not see Chris Matthews on the air talking about it or Bill O'Reilly, but uh, you see Mark Heim on the air talking about it. Uh, it's definitely very important. So we want to, in the very, very least, encourage voters that are watching tonight to make it out. Uh, the, we're talking about the primary election, just to kind of break down in the bigger picture. Right now we're working towards the primary election, which each respective party is choosing their candidates for the general ballot, which happens in the fall in of this year. 
uh, primary election day is May 21st this year. That is correct. And so these folks that you will see here on the stage tonight having a conversation and, and having a dialogue back and forth will be on the ballot on May 21st. So in the very, very least, we'd like to invite anyone that's a registered uh, to either party. The independent parties aren't in the primaries at this point, and they're working towards who's going to be on the ballot for the general election. And that's what's going to be important is this is the chance for the folks to pick the person they feel is best to be uh, on the ballot. Uh, it's a very momentous occasion tonight. Uh, this has been in the works for quite a while. Um, the candidates uh, emerged from the petition process uh, early in March. And uh, oddly enough, this year there were no challenges uh, in Venango County, so uh, sort of a, a momentous event there. Uh, things went uh, fairly smoothly for the most part. And um, we have started to see candidates uh, begin to visit uh, different venues. For instance, as I've gone out and covered uh, some of the municipal meetings, um, Mr. Hadley was at the uh, Oil City Southside Neighborhood Association meeting uh, about a week or so ago. Uh, Mr. Yes. White uh, appeared, made an appearance at the uh, Cranberry Township Supervisors uh, meeting. And that's where uh, they are going to start to uh, pop up here and there because there are people who attend these meetings uh, on a regular basis. Uh, the neighborhood meetings uh, in particular draw a pretty uh, good sized crowd because these Absolutely. are people that are taking a hands-on approach to uh, managing their neighborhood. Uh, so it, it means an awful lot to them to know uh, who these people are that uh, will be uh, running law enforcement in Venango County. Absolutely. A reminder of viewers tonight that you're tuned in here to the Venango County Republican Meet the Candidates Forum that uh, while there's no similar event on the books, but there are a set of Democratic candidates. If you want to talk a little bit about them, um, in the DA race tonight, whether it be Attorney Servideo, Hadley, or White, um, the person that comes from this, this primary process with Republicans will be on the general ballot in the fall against James Carbone of the Democratic correct. Party. So this is just step one for these folks to get to the office. And I just want to remind our viewers that what you're seeing right here is the opening battle, so to speak, in the election. Yeah, this is, this is round one. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And you can see there's already plenty of enthusiasm here in the room. So Absolutely. I think all the rounds could be exciting this year. Now, one of the things also uh, talking about reminders and such is that uh, we are netcasting live, actually tonight uh, on the stream. Uh, the stream is a, a Titusville-based uh, organization, and uh, you, of course, uh, publish the Venango Weekender. The two organizations work together to present uh, a positive kind of news coverage. Uh, what's unique about this is uh, the coverage on the Weekender will be also in the Venango Times, which is a, an internet uh, blog uh, that will be out. Uh, we'll have coverage on that probably early next week. Absolutely. And um, as well, uh, the stream uh, broadcasts on a number of different platforms. Um, this is streaming video, uh, but you will also be able to hear it in a streaming audio format. Uh, you will also be able to read some of the reports that we put up uh, on the homepage, on Facebook, and on Twitter. So we're on a number of, uh, number of platforms. And the, probably the best thing about this is the fact that you will be able to uh, find the archive on this for months to come. So if Absolutely. you missed round one tonight, you can always go back and watch it at another time. Absolutely. And based on some preliminary discussions we had with some folks and some polling, we're expecting uh, viewers tonight in several states, definitely plenty of viewers across Venango County, but there's a lot of folks looking into the race as a very interesting one. I know there's a big Crawford County contingent. Uh, their races are a little bit on the bland side, so to speak, but uh, <laughs> this race down here has got some three very well-qualified people, and so there's a lot of attention being brought to this race. Uh, right here. Uh, as far as the Venango Weekend or the Venango Times, uh, we actually, we reach into seven different states. We have a lot of readers that are snowbirds that are still, and you can't blame them, it's still pretty cold out there today, <laughs> that are still down south and out of the area. So there are folks that uh, aren't here tonight, but we'll be back in time for the primary. So uh, we'd like to welcome all of you to our coverage tonight. Uh, if you can't be here in the room with us, it's, it's glad to have you. We're glad to have you in your homes and offices online. And as we mentioned early on at the very beginning, uh, We've, uh, we've progressed through winter and still winter. Uh, highway construction season has started, and tonight we are talking about the uh, primary election season, uh, which starts right after the petitions are circulated uh, in March. So we're really looking forward to a lively discussion tonight. Uh, this is, again, question and answer uh, with the uh, Venango County uh, Republican candidates for uh, yes. DA, and we will again hear from Christina Rue uh, as to uh, her qualifications to be uh, the next uh, 
uh, Penango County corner. Absolutely. The event is uh, scheduled to start any minute now, folks. Uh, until we get the green light, Mark and I will keep you company while we're waiting. But, uh, Mark, one of the other interesting races that it's worth mentioning to the viewers because the stream is broadcast out of Titusville, there's an interesting city council race taking shape up in Titusville. There is. How many open seats are up there? I believe there are two, possibly three. I think it's two. Also in Oil City, there's two. And uh, while it may not be as controversial, uh, there is a chance in each city for some substantial change. Absolutely. I see we do have one of the Oil City Council candidates here in the building, Isaiah Dunham. He was walking around. Isaiah is a young man. Uh, he looks to be involved and get involved in this city. And again, it's excellent to see such a young face wanting to be involved. I don't see, um, I don't see uh, Cindy Francis, or Sandy Francis, who's also running for the other seat tonight, but uh, I know she's, uh, she's very involved and always follows and, and stays up on the party. And she has contributed a lot, as I understand it, to the Republican Party. So I wouldn't even be surprised if she's out there serving cookies in the lobby, perhaps. Okay. Uh, we are getting the high sign from our producer. Probably time to, uh, we need to talk more. Okay. Lovely. It wasn't okay. the high sign, it was the go ahead and it keep It was the go ahead, sign. keep on talking sign. Absolutely. Oh, I thought I was getting a reprieve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, been, it's been difficult sometimes to keep uh, conversation rolling like that. Uh, well, tell us about tonight. We're going we're gonna to see two different stages tonight. First will be County Coroner, Christina Rue. What kind of format should we expect out of Christina Rue in terms of how will it work? Um, I believe that uh, what we will see tonight, at least at what's according to uh, the program, is that uh, she will be making a statement. Um, it probably will not be very long, but it will probably touch uh, on all of her experience. It will touch on her education. Uh, it will touch on some of the places where she has uh, studied or uh, been involved with uh, in work and exactly what it is that um, the county coroner uh, actually does. Uh, so I think um, not a question and answer format with, with Christina, but more of a statement. So uh, that's what we have there. Following some brief comments, the three district attorney candidates will take the stage. And how exactly will the event proceed once they're on stage and introduced? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm it's getting a little bit noisy in here. People are yeah, pretty excited. It is. <laughs> how will, the, how will the, the district attorney candidates, how will the event proceed after they're introduced? What kind of things will they be saying? And what's the format look like for tonight's event? Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, people that were coming into the, the auditorium tonight uh, had a chance to submit questions. Uh, there is the, uh, the proverbial fishbowl. The fishbowl. Okay, there is actually a fishbowl where folks could drop in their questions. Uh, the questions will actually be screened uh, to make sure that they are uh, proper and not personal attacks and uh, relate to uh, items that are pertinent to Venango County and to the campaign. Uh, that it's not meant to uh, weed out things that would be controversial or what have you. In fact, I think the, uh, the folks that are uh, looking at the questions to make sure that they're proper um, are not really worried about whether it's a hot button issue or, or not. Sure. Um, I am still a little unclear about everything that will happen tonight. My original understanding was is that the candidates would be uh, answering questions one at a time, but it appears that uh, we have a table behind us with three mics and that they will be here all at the same time and perhaps get a chance to uh, answer uh, a question uh, all, all together. Speaking of the fishbowl, it's going just there behind us to the table, so I think we're just about ready to get underway. Uh, the gentleman carrying the fishbowl, his name is Brandon Winger. He is tonight's MC. Uh, Brandon uh, serves on the Rocky, uh, sorry, the Valley Grove School District Board. He has a seat on the board and as a young fellow that is very involved in the Young Venango County Republicans organization. Now, his counterpart's name is Sean Dimmick. And the two of those guys have been running around since we were here about 4 o'clock pretty early, uh, putting everything together. But tonight you're going to see a, a young man named Brandon Winger. Um, as you can see right now in front of us, um, we're testing the time cards here. Much like you see in the presidential debates, there's a time limit for each of the answers. As I understand it, each candidate will be asked a question. We'll have one minute to respond. And these uh, young ladies down here will give a 30, 15, and a, a 10 second warning. And then the other candidates collectively have three minutes to respond to anything that was raised. But it has to be on point. And while we're not going to read the rules, one of the most interesting rules I think that we read was rule number one. I think it was rule number one said that anything that veers off topic or any candidate that's not willing to directly answer the question, uh, MC Winger has the ability to cut them off right there or to say you have to answer the question. So 
unlike what you see these guys on national TV for the presidential debates, I think you're going to see a little bit of flavor and character, and hopefully he can keep the guys on task. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to see what we saw in the presidential debates where um, the uh, MC got walked all, all over in some cases. Um, no. I, I would imagine that sometimes in those cases you need to come equipped with a whip and a chair and a gun and a whistle, you know, to kind of keep things under control. Uh, I don't think that we'll, we'll see that tonight. I think things will be of uh, a more behaved kind of decorum. So Definitely. Well, we're getting the, uh, the green light from the producer's booth here, so we're going to sign off for now, but we will be back after the event uh, with some follow-up and discussion, yes, uh, and some of the candidates will join us, too. Yeah, there's the opportunity for the candidates to join us, and uh, we are looking forward to that. Uh, so for um, Mike Thomas and myself, Mark Heim, reporting for the stream, we are at Rhodes Auditorium at Venango Campus. Uh, we are reporting live uh, on the stream, uh, which is headquartered in Titusville. Uh, please enjoy uh, the question and answer period coming up. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon.
Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Venango County Republican Candidate Forum this evening. I'd like to say a special thank you to Venango College of Clarion University for providing us with the auditorium this evening. My name is Becky Hedgelin and I am the Republican State Committee Woman for Venango County. And I am going to begin with the invocation and I would first like to share some scripture. If you get to know me very well, the first two things you know about me is I get most of my exercise by laughing because I love to laugh. It's the best medicine. And number two is that I love my Lord and Savior and I do not depend upon my own wisdom. So I'd like to read a couple of, just a couple of short verses out of James chapter 1. If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking, but when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to answer. For a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. People like that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. They can't make up their minds. They waver back and forth in everything they do. I think this is a very uh, appropriate time whenever we have candidates that are running that we need to seek the wisdom of someone higher than us because that's the only way that we're going to be able to have any kind of discerning spirit as to who we should vote for. So with that in mind, I'd ask if you bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, I count it a privilege to come before you this evening and I ask the Lord that your presence would be with us here in the auditorium. I ask the Lord for wisdom, not only for myself, but for all those involved here this evening. Pray, Lord, that you would give us a discerning spirit to know which candidate would be best suited for the office of district attorney. And Father, I just ask that you would be with each one of us. I ask for your guidance and your direction on this evening, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. If you'd be Stand with me as we pledge allegiance to the flag. Flag is to my left, your right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd also like to thank those who took the time out to participate this evening, not only the candidates that will be up here shortly, but also those of you that helped to make this evening possible. I won't even mention names because I'm sure I would miss somebody, but we do deeply appreciate every, everyone that did help this evening. I'd like to, at this time, uh, introduce Martha Breen, who is our Venango County Republican Committee Chairman. Martha Breen, if you'd come to the podium, please. Before I start um, introducing governors like Jim Kinnar in the audience, I will. I want to say a few things about the, a little bit about the Republican Party. And first, I want us to thank you so much for caring. You're the people who cared enough and care enough about who you're voting for and what their qualities are, that you would come out and come to this tonight, even though our radio ads kind of said 7.30. There were a few mistakes, and this was the day of crisis when I learned those things, along with somebody broke all my bowls for the question panel when they dropped them out of their car. <laughs> you know, so these are the things that happened the last day, and that's normal, pretty normal. and. We've had a candidate drop out today, I wanted to tell you that. And he's a very nice guy, and he had very good reasons. He gave uh, some very solid, well thought out reasons why he decided not to run, and that is Adam Guthrie. is not running for coroner. He asked you to throw any support anybody had for him to Christina Ruge. And he's um, he, he gave a lot of good reasons having to do with their businesses, expansion of uh, planned expansion, and wants to start a family, and, uh, and a lot of things. I think it was very sincere. I hated to see him drop out, but I also just hate seeing nice young people lose. 
and somebody always has to lose. So from that, from that perspective, I don't feel badly because that's good for Christina, but I remember the last election when I walked in and the look on the faces of Christine, her husband, and I walked in the next room and saw the look on the faces of Tyler Best and his wife, and it broke your heart to you watch either of them. And uh, so I wanted to tell you that, that that changed our program for tonight and how we were going to do some things. And I want to talk a little bit about our country. What this country has done for you, what it's done for me, for all of us. And I think we tend to forget this is the only country in the history of the world, in the history of the world, that gave you and I the opportunity to rise to whatever level we have the ability and the good fortune to be able to do, to use our abilities to the best, as best we can and help provide incentives and jobs for others while we're fulfilling our own opportunities, we can create jobs for others so they can fulfill their uh, American dream too. And the Republican Party is the only political party in the history of the world to establish its policies with that end in mind, to enable each person to be able to fulfill their goals for an education, for creating for job, policies for jobs incentives. So if you succeed, you get a job, you find out how to add a, somebody, you're creating a job for somebody else. Without, with all the problems that people want to talk about nowadays, about the Republican Party and so on, if it weren't for the Republican Party, being consistent in that kind of uh, goal toward fulfilling the promises this country gave us, where would we really be now? So for all its faults and the problems that are had in various, have in various political climates, we are very fortunate, and ours is still the party that is out there to let you and I have every opportunity we can. <laughs> I've already uh, introduced Governor Kanar. He's ignoring that. Um, but I want to introduce some few other people in the audience who are elected officials. Paula Palmer, Prothonotary and Clerk of Courts, where, down in front. And Sue Hannon, Registered and Recorder, an Orphan's Court. Sandy Oden Kellner, Jury Commissioner. And it looks like she will, one way or the other, be back in the ballot for Jury com Commissioner or appointed, and that's a very happy thing. We're very glad, very glad about that. Isaiah Dunham, who is a candidate for Oil City Council. Back here. Is there any, uh, Lee James, uh, is there any? Oh, Lee James, and Maureen James, his wife. And our Lee James, of course, is our new state representative. And I think he loves the job, and we love what he's doing so far. Is there anybody? Oh, I'm sorry. And there is Commissioner Tim Brooks, standing in the back. He just come in. Is anybody else here who's an elected official any place in the community? Oh, yes. Uh, Fred Weaver, who is school. Fred Weaver, who is Oil City School Board, I'm sorry, they were blocked down here. And then, of course, my husband, I blocked him intentionally here, and he is a st Republican State Committee man for Venango County. And Heather Mon Kern, whom I actually did have written down here. Heather Mon Kern, our Venango County Auditor. Are there any others who are elected into office and not heading? I will now turn this over to Sean Dimmick, um, who is our young Republican president, and he will introduce the young Republicans who are, are all young Republicans who are our timers, and two are Clarion County College students also, and the other two headed for college next year, and both Sean Dimmick and Brandon Winger, who are going to be MCs tonight, are both young Republicans. 
Brandon Winger, is 20 years old. He is already a two-year term, has been in two years as a Rocky Grove school director. He goes to Clarion University, and he also works at Staples, and he also helps us out a lot, a lot at the party. I wish we'd have found more like him earlier, and a few more like him now. And he is now the office manager, designated office manager for the Republican headquarters. He's got a load on him. So this is Sean Dimmick now. Thanks, Marty. Uh, hi, I'm Sean Dimmick, acting president, uh, Young Republicans. Uh, it's important that we're here today. Uh, you see, primaries matter. Uh, a lot of Republicans will talk about how dissatisfied they can be with uh, the candidates that we end up with in the general election. And this process is how we select our, uh, the best candidate for the job. I'm glad that everyone's here today. It shows that you have an interest in knowing about these candidates so that you can make an informed decision. Uh, with, with so many people in our area and the country at large who don't see the importance of these local offices and don't take the time to find out about the candidates, this gives you all an opportunity to inform them of what you learned tonight. You can say this candidate uh, answer questions well or list some specifics that I'm sure they'll all give you on why they're right for the job. Because if you walk out of here, go in and vote and say, hey, I knew what I was doing, that's great. But if you and five or six people you know can do that, that's even better. Now, some of you might be wondering why I'd take the time to put on a suit and tie and still wear a baseball cap? Well, that's because I think primaries matter, too. That's why I have my uh, Newt Gingrich hat on. I took the time, I looked into the candidates, made my decision, and, you know, that's something I'm proud of. That's something you all should be proud of, too. Uh, at, at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce our timers. If you please stand when I say your name so everyone knows who you are. Uh, we have Carrie Klingler. Uh, she's a nursing student at Clarion University. Uh, Caitlin Doherty, uh, high, Titusville High School student. We have uh, Brandy Ruth and Renee E.I., both seniors at West Forest High School. And we have uh, Kim Doherty, is the young Republican advisor and Republican committee woman. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce our uh, moderator panel. They're the ones who are going to make sure that this flows smoothly so that you can get the best information possible. Uh, three panelists are chosen by or approved by the by a candidate and three by the GOP. Uh, Co-directors, Cindy Swedson, also rewriter, retired school teacher and Rocky Grove school director with um, Robert Martin Esquire, also parliamentarian if need arises. We have uh, Mark Aaron, District Attorney of Clarion County. Craig Amos, uh, PA State Trooper. Teresa Weldon, Esquire. Matthew Kirkland, Esquire. And Keith Kingler, Businessman and GOP Committee Man. At this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Brandon Winger to the stage. Uh, as Martha pointed out, he's uh, been really active with the Republican Party, especially at the headquarters. And at the age of 20, he's currently the youngest school board director in the state.
All right, good afternoon. Um, I started working with Marty uh, beginning of this year. Uh, as you well know, that's a full-time job to watch Marty. Uh, like I was joking around earlier, the, the event started at 6.30. I said she'd be here by 6.45. Um, so what we're going to start out is I'm going to start out with one of my favorite quotes. is uh, by Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Freedom is never more than one government away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed down to them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. And that was by Ronald Reagan. And I think, and I think that, that, quote, that quote means a lot because that's kind of what we're doing here today. We're fighting for the right for our district attorney to serve the people of Venango County. So when we look for a qualified candidate for district attorney, we need to be looking for those kind of principles, somebody that is willing to go against the grain of government and stand up for what is right for the Venango County people. And I honestly believe that the three candidates that we have here today are very good, high qualified candidates within our community. And I don't think we could necessarily go wrong with either one of the candidates. So at this time, I'm going to introduce our candidates up to the stage and I'm going to start I'm going to start with uh, Mike Hadley. He will be our f one of our f district, district attorney candidates. <laughs> our, uh, our second district attorney candidate is Brenda Servideo. And our third Republican district uh, candidate is uh, Sean White. I'm going to go over a uh, brief synopsis, or basically I'm going to reread the rules for everybody in the audience. I know our candidates are well aware of what the rules are, and I know our question panel is, but not everybody in the audience is aware of the, quest the uh, rules. So these are the candidate rules, and we're going to stick to just reading over the candidate rules. Uh, times, they're going to get a minute and a half introduction to introduce themselves and their candidacy and why they think they can better Venango County. Uh, they're also going to get one minute to each... This is going to vary. Uh, the question panel is actually going to give a uh, various lengths into each question if they think that each candidate needs an extended period of time on a different question. So that's going to vary. Uh, and at the end of this, they're going to get a three-minute summary for each candidate during which they may address any topic that arose or incorporate a topic that they feel is important to the job that has not been asked. Uh, we also have our timers in the front. They will hold up signs where there are 30 seconds, 10 seconds remaining, or stop when the candidate needs to stop informing us. Uh, candidates are not to f uh, fill time saying they agree with the previous candidate. Each should provide their with unique answers. Uh, candidates must e answer each question asked. Any candidate who attempts to avoid doing so and makes an effort to address another topic will be stopped by the moderator and asked to only reply only to the question asked. If the candidate has been told this once and tries to do it a second time, they will be stopped by the moderator, moderator and lose the remaining time they had for that question. If any candidate has answered the question in full and has left, they can make sure a comment to the remaining time is further addressed, a pr used to address a previous topic. When a timer holds up a stop sign, the candidate must stop whether finished with the point or sentence as a moderator or MC will stop efforts to continue. Moderators or the MC may ask any question to clarify fully explain. I'm going to apologize right now. I'm reading Marty's handwriting and that's not very good. So I'm going to apologize with the choppiness of this. Uh, moderators or any MC may be ask any candidate to clarify more fully, explain any answer or question how someone can be done, how, how something, okay Marty, you want to come up and read these? <laughs> They're really choppy. Well basically what we're going to do as an MC is we're going to, if we have to re-answer, uh, reword a question to better get the answer out of it. And no candidate may directly make, direct any negativity to another candidate. So I think our question panel has a start on the question, so we're going to start with getting these questions underway after our candidates give their, their introductions. And we will start with, it looks like the candidate to start with their brief minute and a half introduction will be Mike Hadley, followed by Brenda Servideo, and then Sean White. So if uh, Mike Hadley, you would like to start your uh, introduction. Thank you, Brandon. I, I will start my introduction. And good evening. Uh, good evening to everybody who's here to everybody who is watching on the internet, to everybody who will watch this again over the next six weeks. Uh, and thank you, Brandon and Mrs. Breen and the Republican Party for putting this together. Um, 
this is the Republican Party primary. This is not the general election. This is the Republican Party primary, and one of the three of us is going to be the nominee. There's no time left to think of who we wish had run or who else could have run or who else might run. This is it. One of the three of us is going to be the nominee, and one of us is going to be the next district attorney. I mean, God forbid the Democratic candidate was to go on and win. And so, since this is a party primary, I want you to look at this factor. Who has the most commitment to the Republican Party? I've been a Republican for 20 plus years. I've served the party as a poll watcher. I've served the party as a, poll, as, as a uh, election day lawyer. I've received the official Republican training. I've been a part of this party for 20 plus years. I'll be the best nominee, and I'm asking for your vote to be the Republican nominee. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Hadley. Uh, Brenda, if you'd like to do your brief introduction. I'm not required to sit, am I? You, you do not have to. A little bit of a maverick. <laughs> Some people know that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Brenda Servideo, and I represent the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the prosecution of all matters that occur within Venango, all criminal matters that occur within Venango County. I am your assistant district attorney. I have been your assistant district attorney in this county for eight years. When I say that, that is something that I open with to jurors all the time, and I know we have some uh, jurors that have been on some of my panels in cases that I've prosecuted here today, so they know that when I start my prosecution of any cases at trial, that's what I begin with. But generally I say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brenda Servideo, and I represent the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Many of you don't know me. Um, I, I'll give you a little background on myself. But by the end of the night, after you hear everything, you're going to vote for me. There'll be a reason, and that's because I am the best, best candidate for the position. I grew up in Meadville. I went to Meadville High. I went to Arizona State. I have 30 seconds left to, <laughs> to, to say anything here. Um, after Arizona State, I went to Pitt Law. I had a couple girls after law school, and I uh, was an attorney, and before I started prosecuting, um, I waited till my youngest, Aaron, was in preschool. At that point in time, I prosecuted, and I've prosecuted my entire life, my entire career. And I am the only one sitting here this evening, actually standing here, I guess, right now, that ha prosecutes. And that's all I have to say right now, because my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Mr. White, you have the floor. Attorney Sean White, I'm from Venango County, born and raised. I went to Teal College, got a degree there, went to Duquesne University, and as soon as I graduated, found a job back here in Venango County. I was fortunate enough that I had interned for Bill Martin as the District Attorney of Venango County, and when I needed work, Mr. Martin hired me. I don't know why, but he hired me. I was an assistant DA here in 1986, and I was here for two years working in our DA's office. After that, I was hired by a gentleman in Clarion named Ralph L.S. Montana, considered him to be a very fine attorney in the Clarion area. I still lived and remained here in Venango, traveled there to work. After I was done with him for three and a half years, I came back here to Franklin, where I've been since 1991. So I'm now entering my 22nd year in private practice. I have primarily done nothing else but criminal defense work. So since 1986 till now, entering my 27th year, I've had almost 200 jury trials to verdict. Most of all of them have been criminal trials. I have the background and experience not to only know what the prosecution should do, but what the defense should do. I've been on both sides of the chessboard, and I think that's why I'm the best candidate for this job. Nobody else has more experience outside the courtroom in years. Nobody has more experience inside the courtroom in years, and I'm the best balanced individual for this particular position. Thank you, Sean White. Okay, we're going to start with the first question of the debate. How this is going to go is, I've got it written down by Marty. Uh, uh, Mark, Mike Hadley will, ask, will be answered the first question. Sean, uh, Brenda will then answer the question, and then Mike Hadley will then answer the question. And then the next round of questions, Brenda will start the question, answer that question first. Then Sean will answer the question, and then Mike Hadley will answer the question, and then the rotation will continue that way. So for our first question from Mike Hadley, and you have a minute 
a, I think it's a minute, you have a minute to answer the question. Uh, how will you measure your success as the DA? Brandon, that's a great question. I want four years from now, the people of Venango County to feel safe. Four years from now, I want the people of Venango County to know the Detroit drug dealers are out of this county. Four years from now, I want this place to be as safe as it has been in the past. Right now, we're on, we're on uh, rocky shores. Venango County is in stormy weather. Friends, in Oil City, we're not too far from where armed robberies are happening, rapes are happening, stabbings are happening. I'll judge my success by when that's ended. I don't want you to pick up the Derrick every morning and read about this kind of crime. And let me tell you, it can be stopped. This is not a pipe dream. This is not something that's just made up in my mind. These criminals can be stopped. Our community can be safe again. And I will judge my success at the end of four years whether I've done that. And that's what I'm going to do with the four years you give me as your DA is make our hometown and our county safe again. Brenda, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. I will measure my success as I do now. What I do now is every day that I work in the district attorney's office, cases come in. We look at the cases and we balance. We, do we prosecute? Do we dismiss the case? At that point in time, then, if we prosecute, then we put everything we have into the case. And what I do is seek justice. I seek justice, I seek peace and dignity for all the people in the county every day that I prosecute. I prosecute now as I have within this county for eight years. We prosecute, we put ourselves out there and we fight for you. Just as Mr. Hadley has stated, we fight for protection and safety for members of the community. Most assuredly, we fight for the victims of offenses that are heinous crimes that are committed against them. And that's why I stand here before you today. I have an understanding of what it takes to fight each day as a prosecutor in our county. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brenda. Sean, would you like me to repeat the question? Not necessary. Justice and due process. It involves a balance. You have to look at the people of Venango County to make sure they're safe. Any victim of that crime needs to be taken care of. Second person is potential victims. So not only that person now that might have been victimized, but somebody who could be later on. And then take into account law enforcement, witnesses, the courts, costs, justice is what I'm looking for, and make sure we have a fair and level playing field for everybody. I think it's important that as prosecutors, we offer the defendant the opportunity that he needs for due process before we prosecute him. It's got to be level for everybody. In that way, if everybody can get through the system and be protected, that's what I want to be known for if I'm fortunate enough to win this office. We are now going to sec start our second question. This will be uh, Brenda's first question. What will be your role of your drug task force? I guess I really haven't given that a lot of thought, my specific role as the drug task force. But the district attorney herself is the chief law enforcement officer in the county. It's her position to any criminal matters that occur within the county are in her jurisdiction. And she looks at them and she either decides at that point in time, like I said, to prosecute or dismiss. So as in charge of a drug task force, you look at a variety of issues. First off, you need to at least at the very beginning have a, 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 an understand, a, a, the law enforcement should have an understanding and be educated. So primarily I think we need to start with law enforcement there and give them a, a basic understanding of what it is that we're doing, what we're looking for within the county, what we're looking to prosecute within the county. Um, we have a lot of issues with uh, um, drugs coming in from Detroit, drugs coming in from Pittsburgh. I didn't catch that, how much time I got? Um, there's a lot of ways that we can stop that, and that is through search warrants that can be issued, for example, oh, i got to stop, I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm going to ask before Mr. White takes this question, we're going to ask to hold all the questions to the end of the, each, the, the applause. We're going to hold the applause to the end of each question, so when this question is done, you can then make your applause. Uh, drug Task Force, for those who don't know, the district attorney is in charge of a certain fund, and through that office, that district attorney is in charge of law enforcement, making sure they have the proper equipment, 
training and experience to do the investigations that they need to do. Drug trafficking is not something you just see on the street every day and you can identify. The officers have to have the tools and training, the top gun training is what it's called, to be able to go and target those areas where we are getting deliveries, grow operations, drug trafficking. They have to be able to identify it so they can collect the evidence, give it to the district attorney, be able to prosecute the manner in a fair and safe way for everybody and protect the citizens to make sure that the evidence is not suppressed later on and some victim might be victimized all over again. That's what the district attorney has to do with the drug task force. I'm going to ask to hold your applause again to the end. To, to, all, to all three have answered their questions. Sorry. Go ahead, Mike. All right, I'll go, and I'm going to start standing up, too. Uh, let me just run something by you for your mind for a second. We have a substantial problem with the drug of heroin. Where does heroin come from? It comes from the poppy fields of Afghanistan. Now, when you're asking what my drug task force will do, in essence, you're asking what will we do about drug policy, and hard drugs, is we're going to stop that. I want you to all think for one second, how is it possible that from the poppy fields of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and China, that substance can make its way into our hometown? How many palms had to be greased along the way? How many people had to look the other way for that to happen? How is that possible? Try to book an airplane flight to any city you choose in Afghanistan and think of how hard that would be to do. And yet somehow they can bring this poison into our community? It's not, that can be stopped. I can assure you that can be stopped. My drug task force, my DA's office will stop it. It is not something we have to live with and it's something we can stop. And I will stop it. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to our third question. This is gonna be started by Sean White. In regards to the local drug problem, how do you plan on enforcing the current drug laws? Current drug laws include many things, possession, delivery, grow operations, trafficking. What you have to do is make sure that you get the right surveillance information from your law enforcement to know how to proceed. You don't just want to get the people who might be hooked on the pill and buying. You want to get the person that's supplying the pill. Take away the supply, take away the demand at the same time by treating that person with the problem, not necessarily incarcerating them for what may be 30, 60, or 90 days, and you're missing the supplier of the problem. I'm interested in possibly looking at a drug court here in Venango County that might be able to treat people with drug problems so that we don't have repeat offenders who are going out and buying, killing the demand. But you have to look to the supply first. Don't just concentrate on the little people. You've got to start trailing up the food chain to the much larger source. Thank you. You've got the floor, Mike. Being told not only to stand, but to hold the microphone. It's all right. Uh, listen, you want to know what I'm going to do different about the drug in, in using our current drug laws? I'll tell you very simple. It's one word, forfeiture. These drug dealers, if I'm the DA, are going to lose their houses, their cars, their money, their Xboxes, their plasma TVs, their toys. They're going to lose their uh, welfare checks. They're going to lose the social safety net that they're abusing. That's what we have to do. We've got to follow up every hard drug arrest with forfeitures. We've got to go after these people. There have to be consequences. And it does have to be more than just the simple drug user. Almost if you view hard drugs as a polluted stream, we can pull the, 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 the user out of the stream, dry them off, clean them up, and dress them up, and solve their problem. But, but, but if we don't fix that hazardous stream, someone else is going to get trapped in that stream. So we have to use the tools, we got to use our laws, and we need to stop the hard drugs. We need to end this stream coming into our community. It can be done, it will be a priority, and the forfeiture laws are the drug laws that I'm going to use the most. Thank you. You have the floor. The issue um, in the district attorney's office as far as criminal matters is concerned is that most of them are related to both alcohol and drugs. The question here that he's asking is how the, will we enforce it? We enforce it now. Um, every day we prosecute these same cases. We seek through law enforcement to um, convict these people, both from the highest up the food chain, as Mr. White has indicated, 
to the people who are stealing prescription drugs, crawling across, across floors of their aunt's house for whatever reason, um, up to a bedpost and stealing drugs out of, of uh, a purse that's, that's on a bedpost. I had a case like that. It's such a very serious problem. Um, and treatment is um, sometimes indicated, most of the times indicated, but they come back again and again and again. And most of these drugs are gateways to the state prison because they get treatment and they go back again and again and again at committing crimes. Um, crimes of um, theft, that is to support their drug habits. Ms. Uh, Severdeal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next question. Uh, the next question is, is in Pennsylvania, 95% of all cases are plea bargained. So will you bargain as DA? Will you have any specific policies regarding plea bargaining? And this is the first question from Mike Hadley. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> I, I guess I have to preface with now that I've been standing up and now that I'm holding the microphone, I, I've got to tell you that a minute goes by very fast. It's, it's, these are serious questions, and there's just no way any of the three of us can go into these in depth. I mean, one minute to answer a question of this weight is very difficult. Uh, I would say, Brandon, I thought we were going to say some questions were more than a minute, some weren't. So if we could maybe go to that, that's important. But I'd also say, uh, no matter how much time, we've, we've all done interviews. There's a half hour interview with each of us available. Uh, I'm going to be available for press session afterwards. I think they are too. Uh, so, okay, to the plea agreements. Well, it depends on the case. It depends on the facts. It depends on what justice is. What is justice in the circumstance? But I'm going to be very leery to be making deals with hard drug dealers, to be honest with you. I don't need to do it. If we have the evidence and the cases are done right, we don't need to do plea agreements just to, to move them through the system. Uh, there are times when it's the right thing to do. But on the whole, my preference would be against uh, being too okay. generous on the whole. Yeah. We'll, we'll start lengthening some of the questions okay. for you, but we can, you, we'll Brandon. stick with a minute on this one. Thank you. It's we your have turn. To repeat the question because I, you were asking it. Uh, in, Pennsyl in Pennsylvania, 95% of all cases are plea bargaining. So will you plea bargain as DA? Will you have any specific policies regarding plea bargaining? Well, first off, in, in Venango County, ni that 95% is not accurate. We probably, with 10 counties surrounding us, we have go to take to trial more than all 10. I, I, I'm not certain specifically of, of what that percent is, but we prosecute and we prosecute strongly here in this county. So as far as plea bargain is concerned, we don't do it that much. We do plea bargain on cases that um, some may call de minimis or whatnot, but we see through cases even when there's an iffy chance at trial. And the reason that we see these cases through to the end and go to trial is because of the victims in this case. We can't just dump cases because of, uh, we may not win. There's a chance we may not win. And it's specifically what I'm talking about is assault cases. That's a reason why right now in this county, people do not get ARD for assaults. Uh, I, my time has stopped, I apologize. Okay, the simple answer is yes. The problem I have with it is when you hear the term plea bargain, you think that somebody's getting a deal. That's what a bargain is all about. Unfortunately, in our society, we only have so many days that we can take the trial. You have 365 days in a year. You can't fill them all with trials. So as much as you want to protect the citizens at every cost, you simply can't do it. What you have to do is take a look at a balance. So am I going to have some policy on plea bargains? Yes. I plan on meeting with my underling staff probably once or twice a month as a team going over each and every case to see which ones need the attention, which victim might need a little bit more help, which victim maybe doesn't want to go to trial for whatever reason. Weigh and balance everything so we can pick and choose only the serious cases that need to go to court. So plea bargain, yes, but it's not necessarily across the board in every case. It's going to have to be uniformly applied by the whole office and again, looking at balance. Uh, on the request of the candidates and the moderators, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the drug questions and we're going to give the, each candidate a, a minute and a half to two minutes depending on the length of the question. So we're going to go back and start with the drug questions.
Great. This minute, you'll be each given an additional two minutes, and I think we're at Brenda to start the second round of questions. So you'll have an additional two minutes on this question to go over it, and I'll ask the question again. In regards to the local drug problem, how do you plan on enforcing the current drug laws? What will be your roles of this? What will be your role on the drug task force? Oh, wait a second. Where, did this come from? Where was the one we just handed you? That one. Okay. Oh, okay. We're ask. We're going to do the two minutes on this question then. Okay. We're going to kind of lump sum all the questions together into one general drug question. So I'll ask that, and you'll be given two minutes on this question. The population of Venango County is uh, Venango County Jail is re pre predominantly repeat drug offenders. Current prosecution isn't working. How do you stop repeat offenders? And you'll be given two qu two minutes on this question. Brenda, you have okay. the floor. The, qu the question is then, how do we stop repeat offenders? Um, we stop repeat offenders of um, drug people who are involved in drugs and the drug trade and whatnot uh, by lengthy inpatient treatment. If one of the uh, defendants who has issues with drug or alcohol, any type of addiction whatsoever, they go to short-term inpatient treatment. They are there for seven days or whatever it is. They get contacts there. They make their get phone numbers from people and when they go out again, they use again, but they have contacts, more information on where they can get more drugs. Nor these short-term places, for example, Turning Point, I have a lot of issue with. Um, sh turning Point, when they go, they leave there, they have the contacts, like I said, but it's a gateway to um, state prison. We have, Venango County is um, overpopulated with uh, people who um, are addicted to drugs. Uh, there's a new, there's a program now, it's a state intermediate punishment, and they, they're, the um, defendants are there for one to two years, and they get long-term inpatient treatment. There's a high success ratio um, from state intermediate punishment. Um, however, on a, f on a few occasions, we do have people that fall back, and that's a big issue because most of the criminal prosecutions that we do in the county are a result of drug and alcohol addictions. Uh, and so it w it's necessary, this treatment is necessary, and, 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 and putting these people back again and again and again into the Venango County Jail is not working. That's absolutely true. So long-term inpatient treatment is what we should start out with. After their first violation when they're out, and they're walking around as an offender, I think we need to start putting them there for long-term in the state prison for long-term inpatient treatment. If we just throw them back in jail, they're gonna sit there, and it's costly to the, the county itself, and that is not obviously a benefit for all the citizens and taxpayers in this county, so thank you. Mike, you have the floor. Uh, sorry, Sean. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just as nervous as anybody else is. <laughs> Relax, it'll be okay. For those who don't know, we do have a large drug problem. We have different kinds of offenders. There's the kind that are hooked, committing crimes. Then there's the kind that even though they're on supervision, probation and parole, they still can't get off the drug. And they're called technical violators. So while under supervision, the probation and parole officer is constantly getting hot urines from them, testing positive. And then they come right back into the jail system. Our problem in Venango County is we don't have a county treatment program sufficient for the adult offenders. So when they come to the county, the probation and parole officers say immediately, State Correctional Institute, send them out of here. Because they have 80 people they gotta try and manage and they're repeat offenders over and over again. What I'd like to do with our court system is see if we can't create something called a drug court. We have one in our neighboring county in Clarion. We also have one I believe in Warren and I think there's about 25 others statewide. If anybody would have done their research on this, drug court is supposed to save money in the long run. And I'd like to investigate it to see if our repeat offenders can't be coming in for more intensive treatment with our courts. You will get a probation and parole officer assigned to you specifically. It will be intensive where you're meeting with him three and four times a week. It will be about a two-year program that you stay on this. The recidivism rate is supposed to be very low if you go through the drug court system. The problem that I have to tell you now is I have to watch cost. I think in Clarion, they were fortunate enough to get a grant to be able to pay for most of this. It's cost that concerns me right now because that's one of my keys to my platform. We have to watch our budgets. We've got to be able to do this in a better streamlined fashion. So I want to take a look at what the costs are. But my understanding is education costs money. Ignorance costs more. 
So that's the balance I'm going to have to try to do if we're going to try to do this drug court. Thank you. Mike Hadley, you have the floor. All right. Well, it's been interesting. This is uh, maybe the 30th, 35th time I've talked to groups and, and talked to people in this campaign, and it's probably going to shoot upwards of 200 times that I talk to everybody. But after having made these speeches, a, a theme came out to me, and it's uh, simple. My platform on what I'm going to do to stop uh, the drug user is what I call the three E's, enforcement, education, and engagement. Those three uh, legs of the stool, if you will, are what's necessary. Uh, it does appear pretty obvious that just hammering people alone doesn't work. But let me tell you what I want to do is engagement. You know, Oil, or Oil City, uh, Venango County is part of uh, eight different school districts, I believe. Eight, you know, Pinecrest, Forest County, or eight different school districts. Uh, Valley Grove as a tribute to Brandon. I want to have liaisons with each one of those school districts and meet with them regularly, monthly, to discuss what's going on with the young people. What, what issues can I address? How can the weight of the district attorney's office help you? I want to do the same engagement with the municipalities. I want to meet with the managers of Oil City and Franklin. I want to call in the, the, the boroughs and the townships. So I need to, I'm going to engage. Uh, enforcement. Absolutely, we've got to be tough, and we've got to do the drug forfeitures. I have no problem. I mean, I'll give you an example. Right now, everyone in this room, a Republican, can tell me who the sheriff out in Phoenix, Arizona is, right? Joe Apiro. We all know that, right? I want, at the end of four years, every drug dealer in this country to know, hey, Mike Hadley is the DA in Venango County. Stay out of that county. Don't bring your garbage here. Don't bring it to us. I have no problem being the, the front man for this fight, but I can't do it alone. We can't lick these drugs without your help. So we need to engage the community. We need to enforce the laws, and we need to educate. Young people, all people need to know this stuff is filth. There is no society in the history of the world that's built on hard drugs, and I'll stop. Mike Hadley, thank you. <laughs> this next question, we're going to give you a minute and a half response. Uh, I'm going to kind of read two questions together. They go hand in hand. Do you believe there is a need for a county, det county detective? Explain the detective's role and whether it is a conflict of interest if the sheriff departments are made county detectives. And I do believe Sean White has the floor. I've answered this question about 40 times in the last month and a half because for some reason, somebody in Venango County said that Sean White had promised to hire the Sheriff's Department as county detectives. I've had to send memos to each and every law enforcement department telling them that's simply not true. The first thing you have to look at is your budget. To hire a county detective, that man or woman is going to want a salary. And there we are, increasing the budget more. I haven't even been on a job and I've already been accused of adding more cost to Venango County. No, there's no agreement I have with the Sheriff's Department to make them ever a county detective. I'll say it again, it's being filmed. No, I've never made a deal. <laughs> now, a county detective is used in certain other counties. Mercer County, for example, has one. It's a retired state trooper. I think they have maybe one or two. Helps the DA with their investigations because the police officer's out in the field doing all the other important work, and that particular county detective tries to help the DA rounding up witnesses, evidence, corralling people so it makes the job easier for the DA. I'm not certain that that position is available yet for Venango County. I'm not sure we have the size, the budget, or the need at this time. I am going to have another meeting with a nice gentleman named Al Harrington, who was a police officer in New Jersey. We're going to sit down, we're going to have lunch. He's got some ideas on how to coordinate better so we don't need a county detective and maybe keep the costs in Venango County down and still get the same job done. No, no county detective. Thank you. Mike, you have the floor. Minute, minute and a half. Well, I think this is an important fact to remind everybody of. And I see Commissioner Brooks is here. The law says you can cr have a county detective with the approval of the salary board. The DA alone cannot do it. In fact, the DA alone can't even pick my assistance or my help. The salary board is who I have to go to. So in our system, there is a check and balance. So the potential of a county detective is none of our choices alone. It's with the consent of the salary board. Now, I'm not opposed to the idea. If we can pay for it through forfeiture money, through drug uh, forfeitures, a county detective is a great asset to the DA's office if it can be afforded. Um, now, the issue with the sheriff's office, 
I will respect our laws which say currently the sheriff's office is not a full law enforcement agency. In fact, I'm the only attorney up here who I know of who just won a suppression motion. I see Judge Boyer's law clerk here. I just had Judge Boyer suppress a sheriff's drug case because they broke the law and exceeded their jurisdiction. So I know what the law is. I respect that law. And when the state legislature, I see Lee James here, he changes it and makes our sheriff's police, I'll back him 100%, as I will all of our police. But until the state legislature changes the law, the sheriffs just don't have that power, even if they're county detectives, which is a conflict because you can't serve two different masters. Uh, and, and so uh, county detective, if we can afford it, but only with the approval Mike of the Hadley. county commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I, prior to working in uh, Venango County, I was in Bradford County as an assistant district attorney for a few years. We had a county detective there. Actually, I think um, Bradford County was approximately the same size as this county, Venango County. Um, the the uh, county detective was very important. We used him a lot in investigations. A lot of times law enforcement, um, depending on who the officer is, they can't get out and investigate something that you need. So you use that county detective for that purpose. He also was used, for example, for serving subpoenas on people that we couldn't locate. I, in, in this county we use, for example, the um, sheriff's department as well as constables. So he, bec he came in handy quite a, quite a good deal. I certainly would think that it would be beneficial for Venango County to have a county detective. I know um, as this, the class county that Venango is, we, uh, the um, district attorney can appoint pursuant to 16 PS 1440, one county detective or, and however many more as the salary board will allow. Uh, so if we were able to get the funding, and, and there are a number of ways that you may be able to get funding, um, there's through grants or through the, um, I don't know, bake sales, I guess, at this point in time. <laughs> um, it would be very beneficial for this county to have uh, a county detective, I think. Um, I would just like to, I, have, uh, I can't relate to it now. I was going to go back to something else, but I only have a couple seconds. Thanks. Okay, we're going to jump to some more uh, principal questions, kind of away from uh, drugs and things like that. These are going to be more principal based questions. Uh, this is going to be the first question, from, uh, another question from Mike Hadley to start off. Uh, what is your position on the Second Amendment, and do you f favor more gun laws? Okay, uh, I support strongly the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is a tremendous uh, safeguard of our liberties. In fact, I will say that as I've gone throughout the county, all across, uh, in all the municipalities and precincts, this is the one I find people are the most personal about. I mean, all of our rights are sacred. The right to assemble, the right to have this free speech, the right to vote. But this is one that people really, really seem to feel. They really care about. It's really important to them. And I can assure you that I will not use my office in any way to infringe on a Second Amendment right. I will not support anything that's unconstitutional. Whatever my office can do, whatever the Venango County DA's office can do, I will do to support and defend your Second Amendment rights. I will not in any way infringe upon them. I'm totally here to support that right. And I'm, uh, you got, I got your back as much as I can now, and as your DA, I will support it 100%. Thank you. I'd, li I'd like to repeat, uh, I meant to say you do have two minutes on the topic. If you'd like to elaborate any more on that. I don't know how much time he had left. I meant I to say that at the beginning. I appreciate that. I think you get where I'm coming from. Thank you. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question is, what is your position on the Second Amendment, and do you favor more gun laws? And you are allotted two minutes on this question. Um, I am a firm, be firm believer in the right to bear arms by responsible gun owners. I am a member of the NRA. I firmly support the Second Amendment. I I think it's important for people to be able to defend themselves. It's one of our um, um, natural rights that we're given to us, um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I, the issue within our county, as far as um, gun laws are concerned, is actually people who aren't required to or aren't allowed to have guns, either federally through the Brady Bill or through um, our statutes here in Pennsylvania, um, they're not getting prosecuted properly. I had, um, we have, a, a in a lot of instances, we have people who, who are not allowed to own um, weapons or possess weapons of any kind. And I struggle with the um, federal system 
to have them prosecute these people. They think that the, these people, it's, it's de minimis to them. Yeah, I just asked, I've, I've spoken to them on a number of occasions, just get the guns off the street. Don't put them in jail, just take the guns from them. And we have in our evidence lockers at the various police departments guns from um, throughout this county that are from people who have um, violated the Brady Bill. There's a difference between the federal law and, and, and our state system um, there too. Um, if there's an, a misdemeanor one offense that occurs in Pennsylvania, you're not allowed to possess or, or own a firearm. Um, the Sheriff's Department, uh, deals with that with regard to concealed carry permits. You're should, the sheriff should be taking concealed per carry permits from these people who have them as a result of these convictions. I've spoken um, with the sheriff's department about this, making sure that the district attorney coordinates on any issues that we may have with people who are convicted of M1s. They're not supposed to have guns, and yet they have these concealed carry permits and whatnot. So there's always an, um, we always keep that in mind when we're prosecuting cases. Thanks, I have no more time. I too am a member of the NRA. I believe in the Second Amendment. And I'm wondering how many here in the room know that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has a constitution also. That constitution, Article 1, Section 21 says, the right of any resident of the Commonwealth to keep and bear arms shall be without question. So both the US Constitution, state constitution provides that you have the right to do that. I don't plan on infringing on that right in any way, shape, or form. However, as the DA, you must understand there are certain people who have lost that right due to maybe something that they've done during their lifetime. Mental illness, criminal conduct, these people no longer should have firearms. If you take a look at some of the crimes going on, maybe you will find criminals are the ones doing it. They have the guns. The mentally ill are the ones who are attacking people. They're the ones who have the guns. There is a reason why these people shouldn't have them. This question's come up now as a hot topic in the last two to three months because of what happened in December. If there's anybody here who wasn't affected by what happened to those little elementary students, then something's really wrong with you. But Ben Franklin said this, those people who are willing to give up freedoms for more security deserve neither. So we have to balance this and we have to take a look at, you have the Second Amendment right. Have a whole arsenal for all I care. Be responsible about it. Don't be criminal about it. Otherwise, we'll have to take a different look at you and then take a look at whether or not you should have that right under the Second Amendment and Article 121 of the State Constitution to have a firearm. We're going to move on to our next question. This is going to go back towards uh, Venango County-based. Brenda, this will be your question to start off with. Are you in favor of retaining the central court system? You will be giving one minute on this question. Um, Central Court, if you don't know, it is where we originally, when we bring all the um, charges in, it's the first time that an individual is brought into the court system, and we have, um, they can choose to waive it to into the Court of Common Pleas, have a preliminary hearing, or um, continue the matter, I guess, is, is another way. What happens is that um, a lot of things get backlogged at Central Court. Um, attorneys for these particular defendants may be down in another court. Uh, there may be issue with... Uh, law enforcement not being able to get there on time either. At any rate, I, in Bradford County, we had um, central court at the various district judge levels. In other counties, that occurs. And what they do is they place the different cases out and they, they um, put them out at 15-minute um, time um, sequences. And you're scheduled for a certain time, and the matter is taken care of within that time. And it seems to me that it worked effectively in Bradford County. And I know we have a lot of issues in, in this county with regard to getting things through um, in a quick and efficient way. So I would, it definitely needs to be addressed, and there's no problem doing it at the district magistrate level. Thank you. Okay, I have to talk fast. Each and every law enforcement officer in this county has a problem with our central court. I've talked to the four heads of the different departments in Venango County. Each one has a problem with our central court. They have guys coming in off the 11 to 7 a.m. shift, coming into central court at 8.30, sitting around for two and three hours to take care of one simple misdemeanor case because we're not efficient enough to take care of their needs. In addition to that, there's guys with days off on Wednesdays. They've got to come in now on their day off to do central court. Now you've got to pay that officer overtime. Where are their budgets going? I'm not in favor of trash and racism at this time, but it needs overhaul. It needs changed. In our sister county in Clarion, they have a central court, but they do it in time slots every 20 minutes or so. So the people aren't sitting around on their hands drinking coffee as you will sometimes see at our central court because you simply can't get anything done. 
I am in favor of looking at it and changing it. Dropping it, I don't know yet. I want to speak to the department heads. Going back to the old system may be a result that we might have to do to cut back on costs. But if people showed up to work on time at 8.30, it would go smoother. You have the floor, Mike. All right, I, yeah, this is more than a minute, uh, but I'll do the best. It is impossible in Venango County to end the central court system because our four magistrates do not have a balanced caseload as far as criminal complaints. Dinberg gets a half or more of the criminal complaints. Judge Lowry down in Emlinton gets 5%. In fact, that's why Judge Lobaugh ended one of our magistrates to balance the load. It would be impossible to send the load back to Judge Dinberg and think we are doing justice. So it's impossible to end it. Can we fix it? Yes. We can absolutely fix it and prove it. I, I think the chiefs of police got to be going crazy when their guys sit down there for three hours to, 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 on, on overtime clock. It starts with the DA being there at 8.30 ready to go to work. When I was a prosecutor in Toledo, Ohio, I handled 80 cases in a morning. I had a stack a foot and a half high. I could do them in a the morning. I got a track record of doing it. I know what it takes. You can do 80 cases in a day if you have to. You can certainly do the 9, 10, 11, or 12 that come through central court. You can't, you can't undo it because of the unbalanced system, but it'll be improved when I'm the DA. On time, thank work it. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question will be started off by uh, Mr. White. Uh, what is the most serious criminal trend occurring in Venango County, and what is your plan on reducing it? The most serious trend right now does seem to resort back to drugs again. Um, it's my opinion that drugs and alcohol, take that out of the equation, you would be taking away about 80% of the crimes that come through Venango County. You are inundated with DUIs, you are inundated with drug abuse and drug abusers who then have to commit crimes in order to support their habits. Deal with people's demons and you might be able to do a better job at trying to take care of the crime system here in Venango County. You know, I've heard the lovely idea about forfeitures. What my colleague doesn't know about forfeitures, it's been around now for 25 years. The drug dealers are all smart enough to know not to deal in their houses, not to deal in their cars, or to go in their girlfriend's car whose grandmother owns it, so you can't take the property from them. This idea of trying to address the drug problem with forfeitures is just that, a nice idea. It's been in use the whole time. The Venango County office does it. You just are not able to find the houses, the cars, and everything to treat that problem. You've got to come up with other more viable solutions in order to treat that. But substance abuse is, I think, the number one problem in our county, as it is in a number of other counties. Hey, Brandon. Sorry, Marty was giving me, sorry, Marty was, yeah, there we go. What was that? She told me to point the finger in this curtain. Uh, I don't know how long you guys had given her, but we'll stick with the same time frame from Mike and Brenda. You ready? Yes. All right, listen, I want to address what Mr. White said. I will not accept the attitude that we can't do this. The attitude that we can't beat these drug dealers is nonsense. I'm saying that to you right now. We can win this fight, we can lick them, we don't have to say we can't do it, we can do it. I will not accept that as an answer. So yes, it can be done. Don't accept that we, it's been around for 20 years, it hasn't been enforced the way it should be, it hasn't been used the way it's supposed to have been used. I've been doing defense work for 17 years, I'm fascinated how many times they don't go after forfeitures. So yes, it can be done. The biggest trend that scares me to death as a citizen is these armed robberies absolutely frightening that in the city of Oil City, subway stores are being robbed, grocery stores are being robbed, uh, uh, convenience stores are being robbed. That's frightening. That's absolutely frightening. That's the trend. And that can be stopped. It stops with, again, the three E's, enforcement, engagement, and education. That's the trend that I stay awake at night thinking of how to fix. Thank you. The serious trend is prescription drugs. They've moved beyond cocaine, heroin. Most of these issues now are prescription drugs. You get them, you know, you get them legally, they get hooked on them, and they, and they, they buy them then. It's such a serious um, issue, and it leads to what Mr. Hadley discussed right here, the robberies. So really, the trend here isn't the robberies, but the underlying issue that we have with prescription drugs, in addition to the other drugs that, that are a problem. Uh, with regard to the forfeitures, that uh, drug forfeitures, you can only get them money if 
the event occurs, for example, within the car. So if you're going to forfeit the car, the, the um, transaction, the drug transaction itself, has to occur within the car. The DA's office, this point in time, we forfeit all the time. We forfeit when we can. So I, I agree um, um, with Mr. White in that it's going on right now, and I don't know how we can proceed anymore. But more importantly, the money from those drug forfeitures goes to the drug task force, and it, it can only be used in that area with right. regard to education and, and et cetera. Sorry. Okay. Um, the next question we're going to have. And I know uh, I know a candidate had touched on this, but this was one of the questions. Uh, please describe the forf Forfeiture Act and how you plan on using this fund. <laughs> I go first. We're going, we're going to give you a minute and a half on this one. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, go to Title 42 of our law, Section 6801. That's the forfeiture, forfeiture section. It clearly allows the forfeiture of property which is being used or has been used to facilitate a drug crime. So again, more of this, we can't do it. I don't accept that. It can be done. It's used or has been used for a drug violation. So that car you brought the drugs in, we don't have to catch in it. If we can prove to a judge by a preponderance of the evidence you used a car, we can take the car. That's the, that is the facts. In fact, in, the law allows, if you can prove it, from delivery here in the county all the way back to manufacture to charge every one of them with conspiracy. Everybody who laid their filthy hands on the drugs that ended up in our community are part of a conspiracy and legally can be charged. So don't buy into this. We can't do it. I'm telling you, we can. It can be done. It has been done. In fact, I think the good model is uh, Jefferson County. If you look at what they've done over there, they had a huge heroin problem. They got together with their DA, with the support of the judge, and they came at it hard. Hard sentences, hard enforcement, and they've almost got the problem licked. They're not there yet, but it's doable. Don't accept anything less than that shining ideal that Ronald Reagan talked about, the city on the hill. We can be that community. We can be a place that's safe and free of these hard drugs. Don't ever let anybody tell you it can't be done. Mike. It can be done. Thank you. Uh, are we talking about drug forfeitures? Are we talking about bail forfeitures? What specific for? Uh, this oh, is are general forfeitures? Yes, of what? general forfeitures. Okay, well, there's a difference in forfeitures here. You're talking about um, something that's drug related. You have a forfeiture related to drug. You have a weapons forfeiture. If they use a firearm or some type of weapon, you forfeit the weapon um, as a result of the crime that they committed. You also have what is called a bail forfeiture. Um, bail forfeitures occur if a person is required to appear, they're out on bail, let's say it's $10,000 unsecured. They fail to appear. Um, bench warrants were issued for their arrest. Uh, they, they may or may not get picked up, but in the meantime, what I do in the district attorney's office is I file what is called a petition for revocation of bail or forfeiture of bail. And what happens is generally these people fail to appear at that hearing it as well um, when they are scheduled to appear for that the forfeiture hearing. And at that point in time, the judge generally will forfeit that money. It could be $5,000 unsecured. And then what we have is a person out there who owes the county $5,000. That's on a bail forfeiture. That's the money that Mr. Hadley should be looking at. That's the money that we can bring into the county because drug forfeitures only go to the drug task force to educating or and stopping and, or and preventing any type of or for further um, drug crimes. Bail forfeitures brings money into the county. We have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars out there that have not been collected. And that is something that should be addressed and that is something that I will seek to address as district attorney. Thank you. Okay, let me introduce you to drug forfeiture. I've been on both sides of the ball, both as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney. I have seen Ms. Vion take my client's cash, guns, and property. It happens, it occurs. But having no practical experience, you wouldn't know the following. You can't take property that has a lien on it from some bank or financial institution. You can't take property that has a joint ownership with an innocent party that wasn't involved in the transaction. The major property you look for are guns, cash, cars, and house. Sometimes you're gonna find a house that isn't owned by the drug dealer, it's still owned by the bank. There's a mortgage on it. You can't take it. You can't. 
So when he's telling you, don't say you can't, I'm telling you, you can't. <laughs> you simply can't under the statute. Oh, and let me introduce you to another guy you need to become familiar with. We got a guy here called the Attorney General. Anywhere in the county of Venango, if the state police are involved in the drug matter, Venango County don't get the money through the DA's office. That Attorney General, Ron Thurner down at Butler, is going to have some words with you. It's his petition that he files. That money doesn't go to the local county, it goes to the AG's office. So now you have to separate yourself and figure out, is it the municipality that made the arrest, state police, where's the property, can we get it? It's done all the time. It's a good tool, but it's not going to fund the office to create everybody this great tax benefit, and it's simply not practical, and it can't be done. Okay, our next question is, our current DA has been unwilling to turn over cases involving local elected officials over to the Attorney General. Will you be more willing to let the Attorney General handle, handle cases that your office does not have the staff, time, or experience to handle? This is Brenda's question, and we are going to give you two minutes for this question. You need to slow down and repeat oh, that. Sorry about that. That's all right. Our current DA, DA has been unwilling to turn certain cases involving local elected officials over to the Attorney General. Will you be more willing to let the Attorney General handle cases that your office does not have the staff, time, or experience to handle? And we're going to give you two questions, two minutes. Okay. Well, generally, um, cases that are not that that are turned over to the Attorney General are ones that we have a conflict with. Um, for example, when we've had um, uh, particular attorneys in the courthouse that have been prosecuted, those have gone out to the Attorney General's office. Um, any type of issue like that, that's what goes to the AG's office. So whatever you're referring to about whatever um, cases you're saying Marie Vion refuses to um, send to the AG's office, um, there's probably a reason for that. I can't answer on whether or not I would turn these cases over with regard to elected officials uh, unless I saw the case myself. And if it's something that's right now in front of a situation that's ongoing, I can't even respond to it. So. Uh, technically, I, I really can't tell you how I would proceed on something that may or may not be proceeding at this point in time. Thanks. Okay, I've had to think a lot about this because of my unique position, so let me describe it. As a defense attorney and living in Venango County, I have many past clients, many past friends. What happens if I get the benefit of being elected as district attorney and maybe a close friend or family member comes through? Am I just going to be able to say to one of my assistants, handle the case? Or should I be looking to the AG's office to come in and do the investigation so that there's no look of impropriety and the integrity of the office is maintained? That is my first and primary goal. Everybody under me will have job security as long as the integrity of that office is maintained at all times. If it means taking a look and make sure that the AG maybe comes in so that look of impropriety is not there, then I'm more than glad to do it. And I'm going to have to be very, very acutely aware of this situation because of my status. I had long thought about it. What is going to happen if I'm in that position? Do I want people writing stories that, oh, Mr. White's friend, compadre, fellow family member, got out of something because he assigned it to one of his assistants? So I'm going to have to look at the AG's office if that comes up. Because again, it's the integrity of the office that I'm most concerned about. And I will not have anybody second guessing that. So I'm going to have to get familiar with the AG's office more than what I already am now and make sure they're on board and they understand. And I think anybody else in this position would do the same, have another independent review come in to remove that look of impropriety. You have the floor. All right. Listen, let's, let's think for a minute what that question was. The attorney, will you turn over cases about elected officials that your office can't handle? The whole underlying thing behind that question is there's something wrong right now. The whole underlying principle of that question that six of them thought was worthy enough to ask is we've got two systems of justice. One group of people get treated one way and apparently one group get treated another. Well, if I'm the district attorney, we'll apply the law equally. If you're committing a crime as an elected official, it's just as bad, if not arguably worse, than street crime. We're not going to have two systems of justice. We're not going to have this anymore when we leave Venango County and, and the name comes up, we get chuckled at because of things like this. The whole premise underlying this question 
it ought to be, there has to be something asking, the, the, the reason to ask this. I don't think there's another DA's debate in all our 67 counties where you'd have to say, how come you got two systems of justice? How come some people get away with all kinds of stuff and the rest of us are getting, you know, piled on all the time? Why can Gary Rhodes steal a million and a half dollars and never get prosecuted by our DA, and yet you see an old woman who has a traffic violation in Oil City and there's three cop cars and six guys and they're running around? The reason this was asked is because there's a feeling in this county, and the feeling is there's two systems of justice, and that's not what a DA should do. That's why I'm trying to stay as free from making political allegiances as possible, trying to sign up with this group or that group. I want you to know that when Mike Hadley makes a decision as your DA, it was the, from the pure well of justice that I made the decision of what was the right thing, that I want to be a minister of justice. And so, yes, I will do everything I can to end this type of question, even being asked. You will not four years from now have to ask, why are there two systems of justice in Venango County? Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. This one is for Sean. Uh, there are thousands of dollars outstanding owed to the county from outstanding fines, unpaid court costs, and warrants. What can you do as DA and what would you do to help get these monies into our county coffers? How much time do I got? You have a minute and a half. Okay. If you just read an article in the paper about two or three weeks ago, talked about all the millions of dollars that might be owed in the various counties throughout the state. Venango County had a rather large sum that was owed on fines and costs. The problem as I see it is that some of the problem with criminals is they don't have money. That's why they become criminals. So when you come into court and you place fines and costs on them, sometimes they're so high they wouldn't be able to pay them anyway. So you have to bring these people in for compliance court. You have to keep the roof over their head. You can't let the probation and parole expire without the fines and costs being paid. And we have to spend more time concentrating on probation and parole and our local collectors in Venango County to make sure these people are brought in for compliance court. That's one way to deal with fines and costs. The second way is to maybe think that some of these people who can't afford it, maybe there's another system, community service. And now the community is receiving something back. Instead of the form of cash, it's maybe in the form of some type of service, some type of community benefit that we received where we're not owed anything. It's already been paid. And we need to take a serious look at community service, I'm afraid, because certain individuals, no matter how hard you try, you're simply not going to be able to get the money out of them. Fines and costs are important. It's important to raise revenue. And I'm not saying we need to abandon it. But not everybody fits the cookie cutter. And so I think we're going to have to be a little bit more creative on who should be paying higher fines and costs. And don't forget about restitution. The victim should be coming first rather than the county. So you've got to watch restitution. Crimes need to be brought in in order to get their fines and costs. It's called compliance court. Mike, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. You know, this is an interesting uh, question, and it reminds me of an experience that I had. And, uh, when I first started practicing uh, federal criminal law, and in fact, I'm the only candidate up here who has that experience, uh, when we went in front of Judge McLaughlin for sentencing, he, he, he read off the sentence, and then he said, uh, we find the defendant is indigent and excuse him from fines and costs. And so this got me thinking, well, what is the law on that? Why in, in Venango County does the, 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 the poor guy on disability or, or handicapped or crippled get the $300 fine and the millionaire defendant also get a $300 fine? So I started looking into it, and it turns out that's not the process. The judges are to look at each person's uh, uh, financial capacity to, to assign a, uh, a fine. So it, it would be totally normal if somebody's represented by the public defender and without resources to say, you're excused from a fine. Other counties do this. I, and so it doesn't do any good to pile on someone who can't pay. And yet, if somebody's a millionaire, there aren't too many of them that come through the court system, but if so, to say, listen, 5,000 or 10,000 is more of a fine. But, but just tacking on fines to people who can't pay, federal law, Title 42, Section 407, prohibits collecting from uh, disability or federal benefits to pay this stuff. So tacking this on is wrong. We get it from who we can, and we be reasonable when we have to. Thank you. I've taken a look at um, older files that we have in the um, district attorney's office, and when you look at these cases, the fines on those cases were a lot more than they are now. People would be regularly fined $500. Um, now, the judge gives them $100, $150. So 
I'm not certain what has changed here, that we've dropped the fines now that we're talking about here, and we have so many outstanding. So we have fines and costs, and I know there's been a suggestion of community service, but guess what? These people do community service now. They're brought in by the Sheriff's Department on these, these bench warrants that they um, are, are issued as a result of them not paying fines and costs. They're brought in and they can't pay. They say they'll pay and then they're let out and then they don't pay again. But it's not because the amount is so um, really high and it's not because they're not doing community service for these things. So I'm not certain what it is that's going to be um, benefit the system at this point in time. Fines are lower. If judges see that the um, people have a little amount of money that they're using a public defender, they're not given fines then. Their fine is zero now. The judges do that on a regular basis in order to facilitate restitution in a lot of cases. Um, the issue with that, that I have is with the payment of restitution. I think restitution comes first. The victims should come first, and a lot of times they don't. Um, restitution for, for example, a, a corp, a, let's say Bank of America has um, money owed to them because it was credit card fraud. Plus you have, is you know. Miss Brenda. I go with the victim first, the, the small victim rather than Bank of America. Our next question is, this is going to be a minute and a half response. Uh, if elected, how do, you plan on, how do you plan to change or improve the foundation laid upon by the current administration? What improvements can be made and how can they best be implemented? And there, we're talking about the DA's office itself. Brandon, if you, uh, excuse me, because you stopped there in the middle, could you read that again, please? Oh, sorry. If elected, how do you plan to change or improve the foundation laid by the current administration? What improvements can be made, and how can they best be implemented? Okay. Uh, well, our current district attorney is Marie Vion. She's not running for re-election. I mean, the truth is, her policies are not, I don't want to say on trial here today, but this isn't about her. She's not running for re-election. We don't have to go through a laundry list of 10 different things we don't agree with or agree with. All I can say in response to that, Brandon, is what I want to do. I want to run a fiscally responsible office. I want to run an office that's the model for the whole Commonwealth. As far as, uh, the, you know, we went through this forfeiture thing. Uh, we can talk about it forever. Uh, in fact, uh, as I said, there's going to be a press availability afterwards. I'm going to sit down and talk. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stay and take questions about that all night long. I'm not afraid to defend my position. So the keys are really what you want to do with the DA's office. And it's, it's, it's all the things I've talked about tonight, ending this perception that there's two systems of justice, uh, going after the Detroit drug dealers. There's no reason in the world we should even be having a discussion about Detroit drug dealers here in Oil City. But you know, one of the things I've seen, and again, to talk about the federal experience, I've seen firsthand the FBI investigations into this. It is a targeted effort to come after us. I have seen the, the text messages, the car rental logs. I've seen the entire FBI files. We're being targeted, folks, and I'm going to stop that. I don't need anything to build on to do that. I'm going to do it. On day one, the Detroit drug dealers are out of my county as best we can. That's my priority. Thank you. Uh, some of the issues that we have are, for example, um, we prosecute cases um, welfare fraud. Uh, I think what we need to do when Ms. Vion is no longer here, what I would need to do is look into the Department of Public Welfare. And I say that because what we used to have was a man named Schwartzlander. He would investigate fraud allegations and we had thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that were occurring of fraud with welfare um, situations. He retired and suddenly that type of crime stopped. We're not getting any of those cases in. And the reason I say we need to investigate this further and look into that particular area is because it cost all of us a lot of money. There's thousands of dollars, and all the citizens of this county um, have, uh, are, as a result, have, it takes from their own pocket when money could go elsewhere. Um, the other issue I have, and I had spoken about it, was with regard to bail forfeitures themselves. We have money out there that need to be brought um, 
brought in that uh, are outstanding with criminal defendants. And these are, I'm speaking, talking specifically about bail forfeitures themselves, um, not drug forfeitures or weapons forfeitures. But with regard to weapons forfeitures, I think it's important for uh, more work needs to be done and to coordinate efforts, again, with the, um, the sheriff's office as well as the federal court system or um, the federal prosecutors right in on. order to, excuse me, to forfeit more of the weapons that are out there. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Vion is not coming back. Therefore, change is inevitable. I think the real question here is continuity. What are you going to make sure you do when you get in to be the head of this office to make sure that the victims are protected? So the one thing I'd like to do is make sure the staff stays intact. They've been running the ship thus far. I don't plan on changing anybody's lives right now. Secondly, though, I think the management skills that I have are different than Ms. Vion's. I plan on taking a little bit more hands-on approach. These people are assistant DAs and they are professionals, but they work in my office. We're going to have to have at least one, if not two, staff meetings per month where we'll go over the caseload together. We'll all have input on the various cases. We'll kick the ideas around so that if we know if somebody else is being afforded a plea, maybe the next month it'll be uniform for that person also, rather than getting four separate prosecutors in an office. So I have to tell you, my management skills will be different than that from Ms. Vion's. My approach to court will be to run on Lombardi time. For those of you who don't know what that means, Vince Lombardi was the head coach of the Green Bay Packers. If a meeting was 9 o'clock, you better be there by 10 to 9. If not, you're late. No more of this tip staff running up the stairs to try and find out where the district attorney's office is to be in court. The man with the robe has rank and privilege. We don't. Court starts at 9. You better be there 10 minutes ready to go. I want to make sure that there's no wasted time, and I plan on managing the office just a little bit better with my staff to make sure that that doesn't occur and that everybody is operating on full tilt all the time. We have, we're going to, we have uh, three questions left. The last question we're going to hold, because actually the candidates were asked this question prior to the debate, so that we'll actually review that at the last, but there was two more, there's two pr uh, questions that we're going to have asked now. These are mostly our uh, principal questions. This will be for Mike, I do believe. Brenda, okay, I lost my notes here, I apologize. To what extent does your personal value system impact a decision on whether or not to prosecute a case? Well, I can only prosecute cases that, um, if they are within a statute, if a crime has been committed. So when a, a case is brought for me, uh, personally, the reason I'm a prosecutor is, is, is the result of my upbringing. So I was raised to look respectfully at both law enforcement and the armed forces, people in the armed forces. I prosecute because I have the fire in my gut to prosecute. So any cases that come before me, there's no, uh, I wouldn't not prosecute a case because for some, I, I'm not certain what reason, but I prosecute because it's a crime in our, our very county, in our state, and that's and that's the reason I prosecute specifically. I'm sorry, could you read that exact yeah, question again? To what extent does your personal value system impact your decision on whether or not to prosecute a case? Personal value, that's a form of the word personality. You have to remove your personality and your ego from making these decisions. And I say that because the minute you start entering your personal opinions in on this, you've now become subjective. You are not doing your job. And that's what's been going on in Venango County for quite some time now. Maybe there's personalities and egos that clash. All defendants are not slime and all defense counsel are not slimy. They are entitled to due process and as a prosecutor you have an absolute duty to make sure that due process is done all the time. Remove your personal opinion from the case. Take a look at it objectively. Think about what the victim needs, the other potential victims need. How can you better protect them? Think about law enforcement. This is their career. They should have an input on what's going on. They are there to help you get their input, get their opinions. Take a look at what you might be doing to potential witnesses by taking off work to come in for a case. Your personal opinions have nothing to do with it. Victims, loss of work, loss of their family, 
that has everything to do with it. How about jurors coming in that you got to pick a jury for that they take all day long on a Monday, the first Monday of every month, to sit there and be picked and then come two weeks later for the first day of trial, case is gone. Now they've wasted that day and the following day when they reported for that first day of trial. Personal opinions have nothing to do with this. Personal flavor, nothing to do with it. Objectivity is what needs to occur. Due process is what needs to occur. Get along. Learn how to do business. Be adults about your job. Be professional. That's what I think needs to be done. You have the floor. All right, thank you. Well, in every one of these speeches, I've, I've been able to read a little quote from one of our appellate courts, and this is a, since we've only got two questions left, this is a good time to read this. And this is our appellate courts talking about what a prosecutor does and is. The district attorney is not an advocate in the ordinary sense of the term. His duty is to seek justice, to protect the innocent, as well as to convict the guilty. So uh, we need to understand that that is the role of the DA. To now those are big words, right? Protect the innocent. There's going to be a time where a case comes across my desk and I'm going to be able to say this isn't right. This person is innocent or the case isn't there. And I need to have the guts, if you will, to say this case is dismissed. It can't be proven. It's not in the interest of justice. When the crimes come and they're proven and the evidence is there beyond a reasonable doubt, you need to be able to stand in front of a jury and tell them you believe in the case, have the evidence, and get the conviction. But all times, at all times, you've got to be guided by your sense of justice. As the DA, I'm not the police lawyer's attorney, or the police's attorney, and I'm not the defense lawyer's attorney. I'm not like looking to make those allegiances. I want to make an allegiance with you, the people of Venango County. The DA is your attorney, the people's attorney, the citizen's attorney, if you will. And to do your will, to do justice, to do what is fair. I think we've all seen, if we've read our local newspapers, what happens when one prosecutor gets misguided and goes too far. I think it's unacceptable that we've had three criminal cases thrown out in this county because of prosecutorial misconduct. It's absolutely disgusting. And the facts of those cases, when you read the judge's opinion, will blow your mind. Mike Hadley will understand the role of justice will do the job honestly, fairly, and with financial responsibility. Those are my values. Those are what guide me Mike. as your DA. Thank you. This will be our last forum style question. This will be started off by Sean. How long have you been registered with your present party and do you adhere to the party principles? You will be given two minutes for the response. I can fill this two minutes with no problem. <laughs> for the first 47 years of my life, I wasn't even a registered voter. So for people to say, oh, I think he's a Republican or a Democrat, for 47 years, I didn't even know myself. I wasn't even registered. It was my wife. Election time came around. I wasn't even registered. I had a complaint. She says, you have no opinion. Did you vote? Then you have no opinion. So she got me to register. When I went to write down in 2000, I think it was 2008 or 2009, when I went to write down Republican or Democrat, I didn't know what to write. I've never done this before. I went to write Republican. My wife said, uh, you're not going to be welcome in your mother-in-law's house. She's a staunch Democrat. <laughs> to keep the family peace, I put Democrat. It didn't mean that much to me then. I simply wanted to go and vote, which is what I did. I voted ever since. Now I'm running for office. Now it means something to me. What do I stand for? What should the office stand for? How should I register? Democrat didn't fit. It just simply didn't fit. Maybe it's my station in life. Maybe it's my values now. But Republican is where I was at. That's what I stand for. Less government, less taxes, less interference. Let's tighten the budget up here. I don't want my five-year-old to have to come into a world where he's trying to figure out how to pay off all this debt. We owe him a little bit better. That's what I'm trying to do with this office. That's why I registered Republican. For those people who really want to know, am I going to get elected and then two days later turn in Democrat? I didn't know what I was for the first 47 years. It's only taken me now to figure it out. The answer is no. I am a Republican. That's what I stand for. That's why I chose this ticket to run on. It would have been very easy to pick Democrat 
There was only one candidate, I think, running on a Democratic ticket. I didn't do that because that's not how I feel. You have the floor. Well, this is a great question, and let's be honest, this is something that's going to go on and on and on as far as a question in this race beyond tonight. When I'm done with my two minutes, Mr. White finished his, when Ms. Servideo finishes her two minutes, this question is going to linger. And so I, I think you ought to not look at uh, canned answers or who, who, who says it with the most conviction. Look at their body of work. Look at the body of work of the three people who are up here. And the body of work tells you Mike Hadley's been a Republican for 20 plus years. 20 plus years. Both of my opponents are in their third or fourth month, okay? They're just joining our party. I've been here 20 plus years. What have they done for the party? And again, this is a party primary. This isn't a uh, uh, general election. This is the Republican Party. Who up here has poll watched for the party? I have. Who up here represented committee people last year when they needed to go to court to get permission to amend their paperwork to be on there? I did that for free. I've been at every counting session of the uh, 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 ballots for Republican Party for the last 10 or 12 years. I've never seen my opponents there. Because if you don't care about the system, you can't turn it on. You can't just say all of a sudden I want to play pro baseball and go out and play. You got to be in the game. You got to understand. You got to prove yourself. You got to have a body of work that the party can look at and say, Who, whose body of work matches our values? I was, I registered to vote because uh, May 21st is my birthday, which means this election is going to be an interesting birthday. Uh, before I was even 18, because you can register as long as you'll be 18 on election day. I've been registered since I was 17. I didn't need someone to tell me. I didn't consult with anyone about my beliefs. I know what my beliefs are. And for 20 years, I've been a member of this party. I've served this party. And I suggest, hands down, uh, my record stands, my body of work, as a true Republican for the Republican nomination. Thank you. I think we're here because this is a, a race for the district attorney's position. Um, she's leaving. Uh, so I guess the question then is about um, not about whether you've been in a Republican for 20 years or had an Obama sign in the last election in your yard or anything like that. Um, the question is, are you a prosecutor? Are you someone who's prosecutorial minded? Um, but to answer the other question about w uh, being a Republican, I originally um, registered Republican when I was in college, which is unusual because usually um, you're fairly liberal when you're in college. I've, I've heard that from people. And, um, but when I, I, I went to college out at Arizona State. When I came back here to um, go to law school, I changed and I became a Democrat. I, I had some issues, though, within this last election. Um, the, the country, to me, is on the wrong course. Um, what I see with the federal government is that there are a lot of issues. I look at the Republican Party and I think to myself, that's more what I am. I, I, I like the idea of the limited government, fiscal responsibility, um, lower taxes obviously, less spending. Those are the types of things that, that I look at and have probably for a lot of my adult life really. But it wasn't, I, I changed parties probably in this last summer, in the summer of uh, 2012 and that was the result of the presidential election that was going on and I had uh, some disagreements with our current president so that's why I, I changed parties. But um, I did it m most importantly because I was watching the Republican National Convention and there was a woman who caught my attention. Her name was um, uh, Susana Martinez. She is the governor of New Mexico and she stood up there and she just really caught my heart. She said that she was a Democrat, she was a prosecutor just like me, and she sat down with someone who wanted her to run for governor and they went over what a Republican was and she said, that's me. And I really liked that, but I had already at that point changed uh, parties. I have to stop, I'm sorry. You have the floor. I did already. I am so sorry. I'll take <laughs> In the, in the we'll have one last question. This isn't the form-based question. Uh, in the beginning of the debate, when everybody was mingling and the question panel was going over the questions, we sat the candidates down at a pa table where they all were, so they didn't get to hear the other person's response first. So this is going to be the truest 
re reflect of each which candidate is. I'm going to review the question. We're actually going to have Cindy Swenson come up, and we're, she's going to read their responses to them. They had to write down a response to this question, so we'll go ahead and I'll read the question to you, and she'll read each of their responses. If you are successfully the district attorney candidate, which Republican principles affecting your personal philosophies will be reflected in your conduct, the way you perform your duties, and in the wide variety of discretionary decision making and how you perform your duties? Now, Cindy Swenson is actually going to read their, each one's response. Okay, thank you. Um, you will have to ba bear with me a little bit because some of this chicken scratching may need to be um, analyzed a little bit. I'm going to start with Sean, Sean's answer. It said, due process under the Constitution, everyone is entitled to due process. I will make sure that everyone on my staff abides by this rule so that the integrity of the office is never in question. Egos, pers egos personalities, and attitudes will have to be checked at the door. Costs. I intend to make sure I, I never go over budget. It is important for everyone in Venango County to know that they will be protected and safe and waste and costs will be reduced at the same time. This can include duplication of time to be eliminated, unnecessary cases going to trial. Same question, just uh, continue on. That's just, okay. Protection of our residents by reducing corruption and crime. Each member of Venango County should be able to enjoy their rights to freedom, happiness, and the ability to enjoy the life in a safe community. Okay, this is Mike's. As a member of the Republican Party for over 20 years, I respect party values. I have followed these values wh when I have poll watched for the party, served as an election day attorney for the party, and served the party in other ways. There are three principles of our party well, which will, which will gu guide my performance. Limited government, personal responsibility, fiscal responsibility. The DA must respect these party principles. For instance, I will, I will use taxpayers' money wisely and not waste it. I will support, obey, obey, and defend. obey, and defend the Constitution. I will use our drug forfeiture laws to hold drug dealers personally responsible for their crimes and their homes and, and take their homes, cars, and money. I've held this party values for 20 plus years. And Brenda's personal responsibility and fiscal responsibility. As an assistant district attorney and prosecutor, I think that people should be accountable for their criminal actions. Often individuals who commit crimes in one community seek to minimize the responsibility for the acts they commit. As a prosecutor and your district attorney, I will continue to seek accountability for those who offend, but prosecuting isn't, only, isn't the only area that a district attorney addresses. A district attorney must also be efficient administrator. With that in mind, costs of prosecuting have to be taken into account and ways to keep the budget in check. Testing of drugs can cost eight, eight, $800 just for a DUI incident. As a district attorney, I will approach the prosecution of cases with an eye to how the costs affect the citizens of the, con the county. However, I would never allow crime to go unpunished simply because pros prosecution is costly. Now each candidate is going to get four minutes to just kind of summar summarize everything that's been talked about or if they just want to give them a uh, platform for their campaign. We are going to start with the way we started the questions with Mike Hadley, followed by Brenda, and then finished with Sean. You have the floor, Mike. I have four minutes and I'm going to stay seated for this one. Uh, I'm sure that's working. Only because I want to refer to some things here and uh, I want to make sure I'm getting this right. In the introduction, there was the discussion of the word experience. Who's the most experienced? Well, you know, I'm the youngest up here. Uh, I'm 42, I'll be 43 on election day. So I can't win that battle. If that's all we're gonna look at, I, you know, that, I, I can't compete. I'm the youngest one here. Uh, who's been practicing law the longest? I think I'm in the middle on that one based on Ms. Servideo's version of uh, her history and then Mr. White a little longer than me. So again, I, I'm not here to say I've been doing it the longest. 
It's what have you done with the 17 years, Mike Hadley, you've been practicing law. And so that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. And as I said, I'm the only candidate up here who's tried federal criminal cases to a jury. I'm the only candidate up here who serves on the Criminal Justice Act panel for the Western District of Pennsylvania in federal court. And that's important. The reason that's important in regards to the district attorney's race is when you see a prosecution brought by the U.S. Attorney's Office, you see a real prosecution. I mean, that old saying, don't make a federal case out of it, there's a reason they say that. When these guys come at you, it's professional, it's right, it's by the book, it's how a DA's office should be. In a lot of ways, I want to model my office after that. And so uh, that's an important experience that I have that no one else up here has. I did not, as uh, some of my opponents do have done, uh, taken the public defender uh, contract cases, where you, you get a lot of cases because you're public defender. Almost all of my practice has been private. I've been privately retained to represent people in criminal defense. Uh, as to the number of jury trials, I suppose at some point it doesn't really matter how many you've had. It's like, is there really a difference between the major league pitcher who has 300 starts and 350 starts? Either you got it or you don't. I've tried nearly 100 jury trials, many of them week-long trials, front page in the paper, biggest cases in the county. I've tried homicides to verdict and won. I've tried civil cases, ton of criminal cases. Okay, I'm qualified if you look at that. Um, I brought this book with me because this book is called Pennsylvania Practice, Pennsylvania Evidence. It's written by Packel Pullen, and it's basically the Bible of Pennsylvania evidence. Every single judge has this book on their desk. I've never had a jury trial where we haven't had to bust this book out. And the reason I, I tell you that is because Mike Hadley has been the attorney on several cases which are published in this book. Mike Hadley has the appellate experience to where what I've done has changed the course of Pennsylvania law. That it was important enough for the appellate courts to take the case and write the case down and then for this Bible of evidence to, to, to report on it. And I'm talking about cases like Commonwealth versus Weaver where we talked about what's admissible for field sobriety tests and uh, in the field. And, and I'm talking about Commonwealth versus Hoover where I just got the Superior Court to rule on what's admissible on criminal uh, defendant's uh, character. So my experience, I'm the only guy there, okay? It's not natural for all of us to talk about our credentials and what we're good at or what we're great at, but look at this stuff. Nobody else does that. I've been very fortunate in my practice to have big cases, reported cases, uh, law-changing cases. So I have the experience by education, training, and record of accomplishment to be your district attorney. I'm qualified, fit, and willing and able to serve you. And please, May 21st, elect me district attorney. Thank, Thank you, you Mike Hadley. You're more than happy to walk. <laughs> okay, I'm going to. I'm going to use your book. Oh, go ahead. I want to thank everyone for coming and, and um, listening to what we had to say tonight. And I'd like to thank everybody who set this up and took the time out, um, put a lot of work into it. A special thanks to uh, a, a true friend, Craig Amos. And I also have my daughters here this evening. Um, they had, if you guys can stand, please stand. I have a 13-year-old and 15-year-old here. Get up, just take a second. I'm making them stand because, okay, you can sit back down. <laughs> Last night we were working on some things that I had put together to hand out this evening and I was rather short with them, kind of sharp, and there it goes, oops. Um, and they said, you know, what's going on? I said, well, you know, I have to get up there tomorrow night and I have to uh, discuss things and people, you know, will make judgments about me and whatnot and evaluate what I have to say and perhaps even discuss what, what I'm wearing or whatnot and it's kind of stressful and they said, listen, no matter what happens, you know, we love you. And so I have that going, so I want to just say I love you to you guys. Um, but experience does count. 
And we all know that experience counts. And when I talk about experience, for me, it's being a prosecutor. I have prosecuted for 11 years. I've prosecuted um, in both Venango County as well as Bradford County. I am currently an assistant district attorney here in Venango County. Um, on the other hand, the, 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 uh, my opponents here that are opposite me and have been for a number of years, so I see them in court um, uh, Mr. White more than Mr. Hadley, but quite frequently, and on the opposite side of the fence. And I guess when you work in a certain area for a long period of time, you develop a particular mindset. My mindset is that of a prosecutor. Uh, uh, Judge White, one time I was in court in front of Judge White, and um, there was a defense lawyer there, and he was complaining about the prosecution. His, somebody's, pro, you know, they, I was prosecuting his client and he was complaining about it. How can, t you know, my poor client, they, you know, he's got these um, expenses and it also has issues with, you know, there's different issues that they always claim. And when I was sitting there thinking about, about what he was saying, it occurred to me as a prosecutor, I'm thinking, well, what about the victim? What about, you know, people in our community? What about uh, safety and security? And he was complaining about his client. And what I mean by a particular mindset is, when I was thinking about these things, and he's saying to the judge about these other things, we had a different mindset. There's defense lawyer mindset, there's prosecutor mindset. Um, judge White says to him, uh, the defense lawyer, well, you know that in theory, you should be able to switch roles. I started shaking my head because I could never be a defense lawyer, and he's shaking his head, no, that's never gonna happen, because we have a different mindset. Um, it's not just, though, experience that, that's important when you consider the candidates here today. You also have to take a look at character. Um, there's a, a wise man who said, we um, ask that we not judge a person by the color of their skin, but by the um, content of their character. So character is important. Um, about last Wednesday, I'd say, um, I s somebody said to me, it's not important what um, a person's background is their experience, their character. It's what they're going, they're saying they're going to do from now on out. And that justifies common sense. I think all of you here have probably have some common sense. Um, and I think that that, with our own experiences that we have in life, that is completely opposite of what is true. Um, I say that because we use that in every um, day of our life. Um, we use that to make decisions about, for example, a babysitter. We judge a person by their experience, by their character. Um, in this election, this is about on May 21st, when you vote, you are committing to four years. That's your commitment. It's a big commitment here. And I ask you to give that a thought, um, to stand firm with me, to plant your feet in the right place, and to vote for peace, dignity, and justice, vote for Brenda Servideo for district attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Okay, I now have four minutes to persuade you that I'm the guy for the job. I'm gonna use all four minutes, too. Three people on this table right now are trying to get on the Republican ticket to be the next district attorney. One of the persons at that table has never prosecuted a case to the jury in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania during his whole career, yet he wants the job. The other person has never defended anybody in her whole career in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. She says she's the prosecutor for the job, but she's always been an assistant. Does she know how to manage people? I've been around now, I'm entering my 27th year. I've managed an office, employees, a budget, I've never written a bad check. I know where the courthouse is. I know who the people are in the courthouse. I know who the judges are. I know what they think, what they do, how they act, and how I should act when I'm there. I have a high standard of professionalism when I walk into the courtroom. There's no reason to lie to a judge or an officer of the court, and that, with great pride and honor, I say that. And that's why I want this job. It's a very important job. Venango County needs somebody with the experience to be able to handle that job. September of last year, Marie Vion was running into a little trouble with her caseload. Mr. Carbone was gone. She needed somebody to come in and handle some cases. She called me. I have been a defense attorney, I have been a prosecutor, and I have the experience where all I had to do was shuffle my schedule and pick up a file, and I knew how to prosecute the case. I took a look at it and in about two minutes understood what the defense was going to be, who the witnesses were going to come at us with, what the elements were, what I'd need to show to the jury. 
it's not a hard thing to do. You can switch hats at any point. You just have to have the experience to know how to do it, what your job is, what due process requires, how to get the job done. I have all of those elements. I told you in my opening, nobody has more years of experience than I do. Nobody's done more jury trials than I have. They've tried to distinguish themselves somewhat, but the proof of the matter is nobody's tried more cases to a jury than I have. And if you're looking for a litigator, if you're looking for somebody to carry you into the future and make sure you're protected, I think you want somebody in the courtroom that knows how to do and say the things necessary to get it done. That's what I can do. Being on both sides of the ball, I can tell you very quickly what the prosecution needs, what the defense is going to do, what witnesses and evidence we're going to need, whether or not the charge should even go to court. Maybe we should be doing something else with this defendant. Maybe it's not the right case to take in front of 12 people. Maybe you ought to just do a non-jury trial. I'll be able to handle all of those things, as well as streamline, handle, and manage the employees, and make sure that we cut cost, cut the fat, prosecute, protect, and make sure that the job gets done. That's what separates me from the others. That's why I'm asking you on May 21st on a Republican ticket to vote my name, Sean White, in there. And I think all you have to do is ask, what's the reputation amongst the attorneys with law enforcement? That's who we're going to be working most closely with. Ask any law enforcement member what they think needs to do or what that person needs to do for the job. Go ahead and ask. There's a lot of them out there. Any time I believe you're going to say I have a good relationship with law enforcement because I've treated them as professionals, I've taken away that personal element out of every case. And no matter if I was questioning them, I still understood they were doing a job. I will too. Thanks. Now, as some of you may know, I am in the business of education. I am the school board director. So I'm going to be that teacher that asks you to stay five extra minutes because I made a promise to our coroner candidate, coroner candidate that she would get her, her, her say. So we're going to give you four minutes if you'd like to come up to the mic and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your campaign. Good evening, everybody. I'm not sure how to take this, either saving the best for last or trying to get you guys awake enough to get out. Um, my name is Christina Rue, and I am running for Venango County Coroner. Um, you heard a lot of these guys talk about their education and experience, so that's what I'm going to throw at you, too. Um, I have known since I was 13 years old that I wanted to be in death investigation in some capacity. Yes, that sounds a little strange, but it's the truth. Um, all of my um, judgments for my path have been about being a death investigator. Um, I graduated from Franklin High School and I applied to go to Mercyhurst, now University, um, and be a part of their forensic anthropology degree program. Um, for four years, I studied under Dr. Dirkmat, who you'll see sometimes on the news. Um, and so for four years, I handled forensic casework from all over Western Pennsylvania and surrounding states. So as an undergraduate, I was working with law enforcement, I was working with forensic pathologists, um, I was doing the investigation. Um, after I graduated college, I got married and I continued to work at Mercyhurst. Um, I worked as their lab director for their osteology lab and I also helped um, get their master's program up and running. Um, and then that, those two years, I worked with Dr. Sims, who is the nation's probably foremost authority on trauma. So for cases that involve trauma, I've got a, I've got a good background with that. Um, while I was at Mercyhurst, um, I was able to be a part of the forensic recovery team that recovered Flight 93 that crashed on 9-11. Um, for the first three days, I did the field work, so I was out there with all of the FBI, Pima, FEMA guys, flagging what we thought was potential human remains. For the last two days that I was there, I worked in the field morgue. So I worked with all of the DNA um, analysts, I worked with fingerprint specialists, all of those guys. Um, after getting married and having my first child, my husband and I moved back here to Venango County because we wanted the same small town, close-knit ideals for our children. So 
three children later, we are still here and still very actively involved in Venango County. Um, I have been a deputy coroner here for the county for seven years. I've worked with uh, Mr. Greggs, who was the coroner before our current cor coroner, Tyler Best. Um, so I have been doing those duties when they cannot. So I go out and I handle the investigations. I work with local law enforcement and first responders that we have here in the county. And um, I am in charge of ordering autopsies if those are necessary. And I act as the liaison with the families and funeral homes. Um, four years ago, some of you may remember, we had a different outcome in our election. So um, that did not deter me from this path. In 2010, I was chosen to study with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in New York City for a week-long course. Um, it covered all of the fundamentals of death investigation from scene investigation to doing actual analysis of the individual who was deceased. Um, out of 10,000 applicants for that particular course, I was one of 87 who was chosen to go. Um, I studied with people from all across the county and interestingly enough, in Washington State, the DAs can also act as the coroner. So if you guys want the job. <laughs> um, and so I am here now asking for your support for this time around because I believe that I can bring something completely new to this county. A coroner who is actually trained to be a death investigator, not somebody who is an ambulance person or any other career. I am specifically trained to be a death investigator. So I am asking for your support and for your vote on May 21st. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming and for the candidates, the moderator panel, um, who had the right to speak up, but they didn't. They could add more questions if they wanted to or expand on any. But this was a wonderful selection of questions. Uh, no forum in the area ever covers as, ma uh, covers as many. And you've held up very well. And you gave good answers, all of you. And one of the advantages of this, since it's been videoed, it will be on the stream. Uh, and you can watch it archived on the stream also. And I, there was so much to take in that I would advise anyone to do it themselves and to advise other people to watch it maybe a couple times to really think through all the answers because that, that was a lot to cover in one night. But it made a very good form because you, you, there's such an expansive array of what the job entails and um, I think they did very well and I think the audience did very well. I really appreciate the audience's attentiveness. Attentiveness. I'm having ear trouble. My ears are bouncing around in there. I can't tell what I'm saying. Um, because you've, sm you've stayed. Only a couple people had to leave. And that shows your interest. Try to get your friends interested like that. Advise them to watch the uh, stream also. And, look and read all the other news media coverage. Because this is going to be well covered. And I thank you all for coming. I thank all the news media for covering this. And we thank all of you for hanging in there and doing it. And you're three very good candidates. I think everybody needs to study, study you, each of you, before they make a final decision. OK, good night, and thank you.
not being a resident. I grew up in Crawford County. I would come here all the time. Um, I went to Seton Catholic School, and we would play St. Pat's and St. Joe's and St. Steve's. And I still, I have no resentment towards them today. So. Oh, I was Sorry. Uh, but the question was, is, uh, is not being a lifelong resident going to be a detriment to you? No, I think if a, a person looks at the experience and, and character of a candidate, they would determine that I would be the best candidate for the position, notwithstanding the fact that I haven't been a lifelong resident. I grew up in Meadville in Crawford County. We would come here all the time into Venango County. Uh, as I said, uh, when I went to Seton Catholic, I played both uh, basketball and volleyball. I was familiar with the schools in this area, with Franklin as well as Oil City, St. Pan, St. Joe. St. Steve's. Um, oh, what are you people are getting picky here. <laughs> Take three. Do, can, you wanna, can you ask me a different question? Is this it? Well, yes, I can ask you a different question. Uh, oh, this camera. Okay, I'm sorry. I used to do radio. I'm not used to working okay. on TV. But uh, <laughs> uh, our question would be uh, if um, the line of questioning that you saw tonight or you heard tonight, does it... Uh, does it reflect an accurate perception by uh, the electorate about your job, about what they're seeing as uh, crime problems in Venango County? I'm sorry, what was the what problems? Uh, the, the criminal problems or crime problems. Do you think people have an accurate perception of what's going on? I, I think if you're thinking that the... Um it's a result of drugs and alcohol is the reason that we have a lot of the crimes, and that's an accurate reflection. I think generally people understand that it's not just um, hard drugs that we're talking about, like cocaine or heroin or meth, anything like that, but it's that right now we really have an issue with prescription drugs, and that goes further than what the um, uh, hard drugs will that type of population. Now it's just people that might be your next door neighbor have an issue with the um, prescription drugs as well. And what happens as a result of these addictions is they commit, it's a gateway to other offenses. Um, you commit um, retail thefts or you commit burglaries or anything to feed the habit that you have. So all of that has to be resolved and I think that a lot of it goes to um, really treatment, drug and alcohol treatment and usually it's, it takes a long period of time, but with that resolution, you can find that the crime would go down, and I think that's at the, the very start of all of these things. Good form tonight? <laughs> yeah, I'd say it was pretty good form. I think I could have done um, a better job, but I, was a, I guess I was a bit too nervous. But next time, we'll I'll all be face out the there. camera. I'm ready to embrace <laughs> the position of district attorney, and you know, as an assistant district attorney, I've done all that is required as a district attorney. I, I think I have a lot of uh, a fire and passion for the job, and that's why I've done it my entire career. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was good. Nice to meet you. And the same. Uh -huh. Take Hope care. Hope you can come to Titusville sometime. I've been to Titusville. Well, we're just located about... I'm standing here with uh, Martha Breen, who's sitting here. It's been a long evening. She's the chairwoman of the Republican Party. Just so you know, Marty, we're on camera back here. If you ever want to look and address the issues, or the viewers back there, but I'll come down here to your level. Uh, I guess I need to I'm move on. I'm curious to so hear some, uh, some feedback. How was, the, how was the evening tonight? I thought it was very good forum because, one, this forum covers more questions the way I do it than any other forum in the area. So they get the, there's a much, the voters get, I always, I always aim for breadth, depth, and scope. So they have a better, much better idea of all the things that's entailed in the positions in the job role. And I think there's, there's so much covered though, and these are all experienced, smart candidates. So you don't have somebody doing very badly that you might get in other local races. And I think people should watch the stream, read all the news media about it. Uh, there will be copies of it and, and DVDs available. And uh, we'll get them made, just give them to people if they want to. People should study this and study their answers over again to try to take it all in. Absolutely. Do you feel that the three of them tonight made clear distinctions between themselves to give the voters something to consider tonight? I think there was, yes. But you have to be listening closely, and as it went, as, as you get toward the end, it got, becomes harder. It becomes harder because you're hearing all their answers, but you have to, to think earlier. I think it showed more. But that's only because as they go, you just need to listen to them again. Yes, I, I think there actually were, but you have to listen closely and know what they were each really saying. Because what can sound good with, when, it, when you're not analyzing it, and they all sounded good. But you have to analyze what, what they're saying. And um, 
I, I can think of some particular ones that I don't like to say, but which ones that the answer sounded very good. But if you really were listening to what they say and know what the others meant and what the real truth is, sounding good doesn't mean it was the right answer that you'd want to vote for that person if you know. So on those lines, what kind of turnout do you expect here in this primary? Unfortunately, probably not very high. And this is the kind of election that it should be high. People need to and try to spread, spread the word that it's terribly important who we elect into these positions in, in, our, in, in the county. This position, this person who's elected for DA, what can influence everybody in this county. Everybody who has some reason they're not even thinking of now, they end up in the courtrooms. These, this is going to be their attorney. And how sincere they are about what they say their motives are, um, how much experience they really have, but how much they look to truly care for people and care for this community is terribly important. Perhaps and how people are really, uh, perceiving what's they, going this on is in the people's county attorney. As far as, uh, We're going to switch over to Mark. He's got an interview to go to. But thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll talk to you again here this election season. I was actually impressed with the questions tonight. I was worried that we were going to get uneducated people who weren't familiar with the office or what the district attorney does. I was very impressed with the questions. I think, though, the audience members had a lot to do with that. I think they're familiar with the office. They know what the duties are. And so I was quite satisfied with them, and I think they did address a lot of the concerns that the voters are going to need to hear about. Length of time tonight, uh, do you think there was enough time spent on all of the issues? Uh, length of time was a little spotty on some of these questions. When you're limited to a minute, some of these questions deserve about three or four minutes, I thought. There's a lot more that goes into this. There's more things I'm looking at and investigating that I simply didn't have time to talk about. Some questions, yes, other questions, no. Anything really important that you thought maybe should have been brought up that wasn't? Absolutely. I'm investigating next week a child advocacy center over in Jefferson County. We didn't talk about sexual assault victims. We didn't even address it here today. I'm going to look at a child advocacy center for young victims to make sure that we're prosecuting cases in a more efficient manner. And hopefully by looking at this system they have in Jefferson County, I might be able to implement it over here. Is it something you think would actually work here? Uh, I mean, for instance, also like the, the drug court, that's a very unique idea. It is a unique idea. I'm just worried about the cost of each one. That's why I want to investigate it before I make a hard-nosed decision on it. I think the child advocacy is absolutely needed. You have these young victims being interviewed by CYS, police, other, uh, I don't want to call them law enforcement, but other various people. And every time that child's interviewed, the story might change, which weakens the case. I think a forensic examination of the Child Advocacy Center is absolutely vital. And that's why I'm very interested. I think next Tuesday I'm going over to Jefferson County to do that. Do you have a lot of experience in that area, or is that something that's piqued your interest? I have a lot of experience because I have to defend people like this, and I've also had to prosecute people like this, too. I think when you're taking a look at young victims, there's a lot of people that shy away from it. They don't want to be jurors. They don't want to be involved. But somebody needs to help them out. They need to have a voice, too. And so that's why I'm very curious to understand how Jefferson County operates. Apparently, there's a couple other counties that offer this service, too. And I want to make sure Venango County can take advantage of it. Also. In your closing statement, uh, you mentioned that it was necessary for whoever would be the DA to uh, check their personality at the front door. Is that, is that something that can be realistically done? Do people, are people really able to leave their feelings at the door? I worked for Ralph Montana in Clarion for three and a half years. Ralph was a very well-known criminal defense attorney. When I first started working for him, I noticed in the first month, police officers were coming to his office for help and advice. And I asked him, isn't there a conflict here? I mean, don't they look at you as being a demon? He said, not a single one will. Because every time I go into a courtroom, it's professional. There's nothing personal here. It's a job. They have a job right, to do. You so to and as long as you approach them with that attitude, you still have to do business with this person next week or next month. So keep it professional at all times. I think you can do it from the head up. And as long as it's a team effort and people get the guidance, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Good form tonight. Excellent form tonight. I was really worried again about the quality of the questions. Uh, after about the second question, I knew the quality was there. I thought it was an excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay.
uh, we're back online here. We're waiting just a few moments for an interview with Mike Hadley. But uh, to kind of wrap up the evening tonight, I think things went very well. It was a very successful event for the uh, audience here in the hall. Um, talking to Marty Breen, it was clear that uh, there obviously was uh, distinctions drawn between each of the candidates. Uh, hopefully that rang through to you folks online and that uh, you know came through to you. As Marty said, this event uh, is available to watch anytime on demand at oilregionlive.com or titusvillepalive.com. That's the stream. We're streaming live right now from downtown Oil City, but we will be available for on demand from here on out. Also, you're going to want to watch continuing election coverage with the stream uh, as we get closer to that May 21st date. And also the Venango Weekender and Venango Times will continue to carry some, some news reporting and publications. There it is. Mark Heim. I actually have the mic on and it's working. Fantastic. Technology just baffles me at times. Fantastic. <laughs> Attorney Hadley sitting with an interview right now with um, the other radio station, but we'll be talking to him in a few moments. But what were your impressions of the evening tonight? How did it go? Uh, it, seemed to, uh, it seemed to go rather well. Uh, it was a little stuttery at first, but as the time went, uh, I'm from talking with uh, the candidates. A couple of the minor uh, problems that they seemed to think was uh, a minute or two, two minutes, four minutes, just wasn't enough time to address all of the issues. Uh, talking with Mr. White, uh, he noted that there were issues that weren't even addressed by some of the, um, the uh, questions, and that was the issue of uh, child sexual assault and things like that. And uh, hopefully those questions will uh, be answered, you know, as uh, the campaign wears on a little bit. But overall, a, a good forum tonight. Uh, the uh, quality of the questions were good. They were informed, uh, and it was very well carried out. It's. Uh with these continuing questions and issues, it's uh, probably wise for us to remind our viewers that each of these candidates maintain a pretty active Facebook page. So uh, you're able to get on Facebook and type in uh, Sean White for DA, Mike Hadley for DA, and I believe there's a Brenda Servideo page, and you can interact with folks from the campaign that run those resources for at least seeing the question and hopefully responding back to you. But uh, there's still plenty of time to stay involved between now and the... Oh, the yeah, primary. absolutely. And having looked at some of the Facebook pages today, just in preparation for tonight, uh, many of the candidates on their Facebook page list their uh, emails, uh, either a personal email or one to their office. Uh, and perhaps uh, some of them, I think, even list a phone number to their office. So it is possible to maybe address them and get a, a more customized answer or what have you. Uh, I think everybody made the, the effort to be very upfront uh, about uh, what they were dealing with tonight. Absolutely. One of the, the contrasts that struck me a little bit, maybe the, one of the few points of disagreement was the subject of forfeiture. Uh, I didn't get to talk to Attorney White like you just did now, and I'm curious to ask Attorney Hadley when we get a chance to sit down with him to explain that a little bit more. Did Attorney White talk about any more about his reasoning why he says that that's uh, either not effective or not possible? Actually, it was a question I didn't explore with him, and I probably should have. Uh, we were talking uh, more about the quality of the questions and actually the time limits used to explore them, uh, his impressions of the, um, of the forum tonight, and some of the questions, some of the, the subjects that didn't get covered. Uh, thought that was very important as well. Very telling uh, because he seems to have a very broad interest uh, in protecting the people of the county. Absolutely. Did, uh, was there anything that was surprising to you this evening that you weren't expecting based on our early coverage and early research? Uh, the questions I don't think were uh, surprising in their nature. Uh, what was a little surprising to me was uh, the, the quality or the amount of passion that each of these uh, candidates exhibit. Um, Attorney Hadley especially, I think it is just his personality uh, where the passion for what he does just kind of bleeds to the top. Uh, and I think that was very, very evident. But each of these very professional people, very well educated about what they're doing with a clear idea and a clear vision of what needs to be done and how it will be done or how it should be done, uh, I think the voters have a very clear choice. Absolutely. It looks like uh, Attorney Hadley's just getting up from his other interview. Would you join us, Attorney Hadley? Okay. All right, gentlemen, are we talking now? We're talking on the air. The viewers are watching from that camera up there, and we'll talk to you here for a little bit. The light or you want to we'll step forward Yeah, we could probably bit. step up a little bit. <laughs> well, what are your initial reactions to how, how did this evening go? What's your take on the whole? evening well it, it's interesting I mean, I'm so glad as, as many people turned out as they did I mean looking out here for 
what did we go, an hour and a half or so. I mean, you know, people got their buttons. I mean, we realized basically everyone was here either has their mind made up or is leaning one way or another. But the real issue was, was reaching out through the internet, through the newspapers, through the reporting, uh, to, 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 to all the people, the 5,000 people who are going to vote on May 21st in the Republican Party. And I felt I had a great opportunity to say what I wanted to say. No questions were asked, uh, or that I wanted asked weren't asked. I think everything to distinguish uh, what I bring to the table and my skill set and in, in, in my philosophy was able to be brought out. So in that regard, I'm very thankful. I think it went well. Uh, wouldn't have any complaints, really. I mean, anything can be tweaked here and there, but really happy we did it. In fact, uh, if you guys can get it together, let's let's do another one. Let's do one in a month, <laughs> you know? Mark and I were just talking about that uh, there was all kinds of subjects that weren't even covered. Uh, Attorney White was saying there was all kinds of things he wanted to discuss or was willing to discuss that we didn't even get to tonight in the two hours that uh, you folks went. I'm sure it went quickly for you. It was two hours long. Yeah. But uh, uh, one of the questions that uh, I wanted to ask you was, was there anything um, that, that you think you were able to draw a clear distinction between the candidates, or were there any moments that you felt that you all became individual personalities? Well, I think the biggest difference is, and as I said when the party question came up, that this isn't going to go away tonight with a two-minute answer. This is the Republican Party primary, and the distinction is pretty clear. I mean, my record as a party member, party supporter, party attorney, poll watcher is pretty clear. And so that issue is is going to be out there. I think the distinctions are, 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 are huge. And uh, I'm not comfortable that, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going on the attack. I'm not that type of guy. I'm here with a positive message of what I'm going to do to make this a safer, better community. But that issue isn't going to go away. And, and I think that was huge for the differences. I think people know where Mike Hadley has stood and where the others who you can't deny it, just switched a few months ago to come to this party to run, and uh, that's going to be an issue that's going to be out there. Your passion uh, kind of leaked through it a, a couple of times, and I think that's not a bad thing. Uh, on the forfeiture issue, you were particularly uh, vehement about. I guess my question is, tonight's forum, you mentioned, please don't tell me that this cannot be done. How can you be so sure about that? Well, I mean, the statute's right there. Read uh, Title 42. It says, used or intended to be used for the commission of drug offenses. I mean, I don't understand this. I mean, admittedly, uh, uh, if someone's home has a mortgage against it, uh, uh, the mortgage will be first in priority. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about drug dealers who have uh, Xboxes and Playstations and, and bigger video collections than any of us. And all of this through ill-gotten gains. So, uh, I, I'm not looking at the obstacles, guys. I'm not here, I can't do this, can't do that. I'm looking at what we can do and going to do what we can do. So I, I, I'm not even sure how this early in the game, before any of us have been elected or taken, uh, and again, my passion's coming out again, <laughs> I, I see that. But before we've taken the oath of office or, or got sworn in, that you're saying what you're not going to do? If you start with the bar this low, where are you? I'm reaching for the sky. Well, you, you are know? obviously reaching out. Overall, this is a broad spectrum uh, yeah. where you're saying, please don't tell me this cannot be done. I don't believe for one minute, as the Commonwealth's attorney, I can't fix these problems. And if, if, if the tool that I'm thinking of right now isn't the only tool, then so be it. We'll pick up another one. But we're not going to quit. We're not going to go in there with the attitude that, uh, 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 well, it can't be done. We just have to live with it. We just got to tread water and hope it doesn't get any worse and the flood doesn't take us out. That's, that's not an attitude that I'm bringing to this game. And that's why... You know, I'm, I'm not running for a paycheck. I'm not running for a promotion. I'm running for the people. I'm running to, to fix these problems that are here. I see it. I live it. I mean, I'm scared to death of what's happening in Oil City. And, it's and with unemployment hitting 9.2%, uh, what, last month we're still over 9%. What does that bring? That brings crime. So I'm not starting with what we can't do, setting a goal too low. I'm going for everything we can, and I believe we can accomplish it. So... If it's passion, call it passion, but it's, uh, it's for the people. Penango County needs this. I'll well, ask you one final question, let you get back out to your uh, loyal supporters here. What does the rest of the primary campaign look, for, look like for you, and how do people follow your campaign for DA? Well, we're on the websites and the Facebook page and the Twitter, and, of course, I'm available for media availability anytime. I mean, I hope all the other candidates agree. Come talk to us. If you've got questions, you have issues, come to me. I'm not uh, unavailable. I'm easy to get a hold of. Um, but it's uh, six weeks to go till May 21st. That's a lot of door knocking, a lot of meeting people. I hope we have another forum, another debate. It's, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, all of that stuff, the basic, uh, what they call retail politics. You've got to be out there. You've got to be involved. You've got to 
you know, spend the money to be on the radio, spend the money to be in the newspaper. You got to work, uh, you got to meet people. And so uh, uh, that's, that's what it looks like. Six, well, six weeks like I've never had before in my life, right? <laughs> I mean, well, it looks like you're ready to sell Mike Hadley to the public. Well, I hope so, and I hope the people like it. And if they have questions, go on Facebook slash Mike Hadley 2013. Go to, to, to the Yahoo. Get a hold of me. Let's talk. I, you know, if there's better ideas, I'll listen. I'll learn. I mean, uh, but, but this energy has to be here. It has to be legit. The county can't continue. We can't continue down this road. It's not working. It's not a, a coincidence that the streets aren't paved, that the storefronts are empty, that the jobs are fleeing, that we're tearing down buildings as success instead of building them up. I want to get us where we're building up. And so uh, whatever it takes, I'm committed. I'm in this thing 100%. This is no, uh, you know, this isn't a fluke. This isn't just pretend. This is the real deal, and I'm in this 100%. And to all the people watching, please help. Call me. Get involved if you can. Let's do this together. Thank you for being with us tonight. Yes, thank you for your time. Good luck to you the rest of the primary. Congratulations. We'll talk to you again soon. That's Attorney Mike Hadley from Oil City, running for Venango County District Attorney on the Republican uh, Party's ticket. Well, Mark, what do you think? I'm, I'm glad this only comes once in a while. I think it was very good tonight, but uh, I think everybody's probably had a, enough tonight. Uh, I, uh, I look forward to more conversations, though, because, as uh, Mr. White said, there's a lot more to talk about. Absolutely. It should be an interesting six weeks. And uh, we welcome all the, the viewers out there to follow all the news of the primary campaign on uh, the stream at oilregionlive.com and titusvillepalive.com. And also watch for continuing coverage from the Venango Weekender and Venango Times. That's venangoweekender.com. And we want to thank all of our viewers and listeners tonight uh, for staying with us this period of time. And uh, we sign off tonight. Uh, Mike Hadley. Uh, here I'm calling Not you. Not quite. Yeah. Mike Thomas. <laughs> Mike Thomas and myself, Mark Heim, uh, reporting for The Stream in Titusville and reporting for the Venango Weekender in uh, Venango County in Franklin. Uh, both of us for The Stream, and we thank you for watching and have a great night. Have a good night.